Chapter Four, Part Twenty Three of the Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume Ten. Ingersoll's Closing Address to the Jury in the Second Star Route Trial, Part Twenty Three of Twenty Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana in january two thousand nineteen part twenty three now let me speak just a moment about these people the defendants in this case first there is stephen w dorsey i take a great interest in this case i admit it i would rather lose my right hand than have you convict stephen w dorsey i admit it I admit that if he were convicted, I would lose confidence in trial by jury. I would believe that there were no twelve men in the world that had the honor and the manhood to stand by what they believed to be the evidence and the law. I would feel as though trial by jury was a failure. I admit I have that interest in it, all that anybody can have in any case. You can only convict that man by the testimony of A. W. Moore and M. C. Rurdell. That testimony withdrawn from the record, and there is not one word against him. I want you to know, and I want you to remember what kind of a man he is. You have seen him, you know him, and you know something of him. It is for you to decide whether you will take the testimony of Rurdell as against that man. It is for you to decide whether you will take the testimony of A. W. Moore as against that man. These men who are prosecuting him seem to forget who he is and what he has been. Yet men disgrace the position that Stephen W. Dorsey helped to give them by attacking him. John W. Dorsey can be convicted by the testimony of nobody. There is no testimony against him except that of one man, he is an honest man. He told exactly what he did, and he told it like an honest man. He told why he did not put his money in his pocket in the bank at Middlebury, Vermont, because they thought that he owed a debt which he did not think he owed. He need not have told it, but he is an honest man, and that is the reason he told it. The prosecution does not appreciate that kind of man, that is, they say they do not. The only witnesses against Minor are Riddell and Moore, and they being dead, that is the end of it. What evidence is there against Harvey M. Vale? One witness, Mr. Riddell. What did Harvey M. Vale do? At the solicitation of Mr. Minor, he advanced money to prevent his having a failing contract. What else did he do? He wrote a letter saying that he was trustee for S.W. Dorsey, and he was, because the concern owed S.W. Dorsey a few thousand dollars, and agreed out of the profits to repay Stephen W. Dorsey. That is all. That is all. You have seen Mr. Vale here from day to day. You know that he is a man of mind. I think he is an honest man. I think he testified to the exact truth. He did what any other man has the right to do. He helped a man not entirely from charity, but believing, after all, that it might be a good investment, as you have done if you have ever had the opportunity. And there is not the slightest scintilla of evidence against him, not the slightest. I believe every word that he testified, and so do you. And then they come to Thomas J. Brady, and they tell you that that man is to be convicted upon the testimony of whom? Mr. Walsh? And who else? Mr. Rodell. You have some idea of human nature. You have a little, and I have a little. Here is Mr. Walsh, an athlete, a man who, had he lived in Rome in ancient times, might have been a gladiator. He loans Mr. Brady 25000 or $30,000. For some of this money he has notes. For other portions he has not. He sends word to Brady that he would like to fix the interest. He goes there, and Brady takes these notes and puts them in his pocket, and they part as philosophers. If we believe that, we must believe it as idiots. You do not believe it. 
you do not believe any man ever allowed another man to take twenty five thousand dollars in notes belonging to him and put them in his pocket and walk off he taking off his hat at the door and you bowing and wishing him a happy voyage my mind is so constructed that i cannot believe that i cannot help it i imagine your minds are built a little after the same model i do not believe the story you do not who is the next witness against mr brady mr Rodell. it is sufficient for me to speak the name i need argue no further that is enough you saw mr brady on the stand and you heard him give his testimony no man could listen to it without knowing it to be true i say now to each one of you that when you heard it you believed it and every one of you believed it was the truth take from this record the testimony of Rodell, walsh and moore and what is left some papers petitions orders affidavits all made signed and filed in the cloudless light of day that is all that is left where is your conspiracy faded into thin air nothing left i presume it will be said by the prosecution that i spent about three days on mr Rodell. i admit it why because i regarded Rodell as your case because i made up my mind that when i killed Rodell, the case had breathed its last that is the reason and had it been necessary to spend a few weeks more i should have done so but it is not necessary probably i wasted a great deal of time upon the subject but if he is not dead i do not want it in the power of any human being to say that it was my fault i went at him with intent to kill and i kept at him after i knew that he was dead i admit it now gentlemen let us see what i have proved let us see what up to this time i have substantiated in my judgment first i think i have shown that john w dorsey john m peck and john r minor agreed in eighteen seventy seven to go into the mail business that peck wrote a letter to stephen w dorsey who was then a united states senator asking him to get some competent man to get reliable information as to the cost of service on routes in the western states and territories then advertised by the general government that s w dorsey gave that letter to a e boone that he told him to say nothing about it to the other contractors that boone sent out circulars for the purpose of getting the requisite information that is the cost of corn and oats and the wages of men that john r minor came to washington on the first of december eighteen seventy seven that he went to the house of stephen w dorsey as had been the custom for several years that he occupied a room in that house and that he and mr boone went on with the business of making proposals and getting up forms of contracts that john w dorsey came here in the early part of january eighteen seventy eight that after his arrival the partnership was formed between him and a e boone and that the partnership was dated the fifteenth day of january eighteen seventy eight that s w dorsey at the request of his brother and brother-in-law advanced the amount of money necessary to pay incidental expenses that he gave his advice whenever it was asked that he assisted the parties all that he conveniently could that the last bids or proposals were put in by these parties on the second of february eighteen seventy eight that the awards were made on the fifteenth day of march of the same year that minor peck dorsey and boone received about five times as many awards as they had anticipated thereupon another partnership was formed with the style of minor peck and company and that the partners in this firm were john r minor john m peck and john w dorsey that thereupon john w dorsey and john r minor went west for the purpose of subcontracting the routes that john r minor on his return from the west met stephen w dorsey at st louis about the sixteenth of july eighteen seventy eight that stephen w dorsey up to that time had advanced eight thousand or nine thousand dollars 
that he then gave to Mr. Minor notes amounting to about $8,500 to be by him discounted at the German-American National Bank of Washington. That Stephen W. Dorsey then told Minor that he would advance no more and would endorse no more. That Stephen W. Dorsey went from St. Louis to New Mexico. That John R. Minor came to the city of Washington, arriving here about the 20th of July that John R. Minor then found that service in eastern Oregon was not in operation, although it had been subcontracted, but he then applied to Thomas J. Brady for an extension of time, that Brady refused to give it, that Minor, Peck, and Company had not the money to stock the routes not then in operation, and that Stephen W. Dorsey had refused to advance further means that John W. Dorsey was then in the West, and that John M. Peck was then in New Mexico, that thereupon Mr. Minor applied to Harvey M. Vail, and that Mr. Vail went to Mr. Brady and asked whether an extension of time could be given, provided he undertook to put the service on those routes, that Brady then gave him until the 16th day of August, 1878, that thereupon Minor, under the authority of powers of attorney from John M. Peck and John W. Dorsey, agreed upon the terms on which H. M. Vale should advance the money necessary to put the service in operation. That the contract bears date of 16th day of August, 1878, and was duly executed by all the parties on the last of September or 1st of October of that year that the service was not in operation by the 16th of August, and that in August Brady telegraphed to H. M. Vale to know what routes he was going to put service on, that thereupon Vale replied that he would see that all the service of Minor, Peck, and Dorsey was put in operation, that through the assistance of Mr. Vale the service was put in operation that before that time Stephen W. Dorsey had been secured by Minor, Peck, and John W. Dorsey, executing post office drafts upon the routes that had been awarded to them, that on the 17th day of May, 1878, an act was passed by the Congress of the United States allowing subcontractors to place their subcontracts on file, that after Vale came in and agreed to furnish the money necessary to put the service in operation, John R. Minor, having powers of attorney from Peck and John W. Dorsey, executed to H. M. Vale subcontracts for the purpose of securing him for the money he had advanced. That H. M. Vale put these subcontracts on file, thus cutting out and rendering worthless as security the post office drafts that had been given to S. W. Dorsey for the purpose of securing him. That John W. Dorsey returned from the Bismarck and Tongue River route in November, 1878, and that he then offered to sell out his entire interest in the business to Vale for ten thousand dollars and left instructions authorizing his brother s w dorsey to make such sale for such amount that john w dorsey then returned to the tongue river route that stephen w dorsey returned to washington in december eighteen seventy eight and for the first time found that the subcontracts have been given to vale that he and Mr. Vale had a quarrel with the German-American National Bank on that question, that afterwards Dorsey was to give $10,000 to John W. Dorsey and $10,000 to John M. Peck, that he then concluded not to do so, that on the fourth day of March, when S. W. Dorsey's senatorial term expired, he immediately wrote a letter to Brady insisting that the subcontracts that had been filled by Vale were in fraud of his rights, that thereupon the parties in interest came together, that S. W. Dorsey acting for Peck, his brother, and himself agreed with Vale and Minor to a division of the routes, that S. W. Dorsey paid Peck $10,000 for his interest, paid John W. Dorsey $10,000 for his interest, and took substantially 30% of the routes and paid himself the money that was owing to him by Minor, Peck, and Company. That the parties at the time executed to each other subcontracts and such other papers as were necessary to vest, 
as far as they then under the law could vest the routes so divided in the parties to whom they fell that on the fifth day of may eighteen seventy nine the division was completed and that from that time forward vale and minor had no interest in the routes that fell to stephen w dorsey and that from that time forward stephen w dorsey had no interest in the routes that fell to vale and minor and that john w dorsey and john m peck had no interest in any route from that date forward until the present moment that s w dorsey took entire and absolute control of his routes and that minor and vale took entire control of their routes that from that time until the present neither party interfered with the routes of the others that vale and minor made no paper of any sort character or kind for stephen w dorsey after the fifth of may eighteen seventy nine and that neither john w dorsey nor john m peck made any papers of any kind sort or character for minor or vale after that date no matter what date papers bear that were made before that time that s w dorsey made no papers for minor or vale after that date and that minor and vale made no papers for s w dorsey after that date may fifth eighteen seventy nine that all the papers bearing date after the 5th of May were in fact signed by the parties at or before that time, that they were so signed for the purpose of making the division complete, that Vale and Minor on their routes got up petitions that they had a right to do, that S.W. Dorsey upon his routes got up petitions as he had the right to do, that the routes were increased and expedited by the second assistant postmaster general in accordance with the policy of the department and in accordance with the petitions filed and the affidavits made as he had a right to do that it was not for the contractors to settle the policy of the post office department that the evidence of a w moore is unworthy of belief and that his statement that he settled with s w dorsey is demonstrated to be false by the receipts that he afterwards gave in final settlement to john r minor as admitted by himself that his testimony as to the existence of a conspiracy is rendered worthless and absurd by the fact that he sold out not only his interest but his services up to that time for six hundred and eighty two dollars that his conversations with minor could not have taken place that he never made or offered to make such contracts with major as he pretended he was instructed to make and as he swore that he did make that his conversation with s w dorsey never occurred that the testimony of rodell is utterly and infinitely unworthy of credit that he is not only contradicted by all the evidence but by himself and how can you corroborate a man who tells no truth there must be something to be corroborated that the red books never existed that the pencil memorandum was forged by himself that the chico letter was written by him and that the letter from dorsey to bosler said to have been dated may thirteenth eighteen seventy nine was born of the imagination of mr Verdell that Riddell's letter to Bosler of the 22nd of May, 1880, was never sent, was never received, and was never written until after this man made up his mind to become a witness for the government. That Bosler never received that letter, or the letter pretended to have been written by Dorsey on the 13th of May, 1879. That a tabular statement in which 33 and one-third percent was allowed to Brady never existed that Riddell did not visit Dorsey's office in New York in June 1881, and that he had no conversation with Tory, that Riddell was not there, that he did not have the conversation detailed by him with Dorsey at the Albemarle Hotel, that Dorsey did not write the letter of the 13th of June 1881, that Riddell swore in June 1881 that Dorsey was entirely innocent, that he swore to three affidavits of the same kind, that he again swore to the same thing on the 13th of July, 1882, that he admitted by his letter of July 5th, 
1882, that S. W. Dorsey did not even ask him to make the affidavit of June 1881, but that he was persuaded to do it by James W. Bosler, that he was not locked up at Willard's Hotel, that he was not threatened with a prosecution for perjury, that he was not shown the letters he had written to a woman, that the whole story with regard to the making of that affidavit was utterly and unqualifiedly false, that he never had the conversation with Thomas J. Brady that he claimed, that Brady never suggested to him to have any books copied, that there were no books of Dorsey's that needed to be copied, that he did not see S.W. Dorsey draw any money at Middleton's bank at the time he states, that he, Riddell, drew the money himself, and that his entire testimony is absurd, contradictory, and utterly unworthy of credit. Let me say another thing to you gentlemen right here. It would be better a thousand times that all the defendants tried in the next one hundred years should escape punishment than that one man should be convicted upon the evidence of a man like this a man who offered to the government to make a bargain while the trial was in progress, that he would challenge from the jury all the friends of the defendants and help the government to get the enemies of the defendants upon the jury. You never can afford to take the evidence of such a man. It turns a courthouse into a den of wild beasts. You cannot do it. I have shown that the story of Walsh is improbable, and that all that Boone swears against these defendants cannot be believed, that Walsh never loaned the money to Brady that he claimed, and that Brady never took from him the notes as he says, that Brady never made in his presence the admissions that he swears to. Think of it, Brady robbing Walsh, and at the same time saying to Walsh, I am a thief and public robber. I have shown to you, gentlemen, it seems to me, that no reasonable human being, taking all this evidence into consideration, can base upon it a verdict of guilty. It cannot be done. Now, gentlemen, the responsibility is upon you. And what is that responsibility? You are to decide a question involving all that these defendants are. You are to decide a question involving all that these defendants hope to be. Their fate is in your hands. Everything they love, everything they hold dear, is in your power. With this fearful responsibility upon you, you have no right to listen to the whispers of suspicion. You have no right to be guided or influenced by prejudice. You have no right to act from fear. You must act with absolute and perfect honesty. You must beware of prejudice. You must beware of taking anything into consideration except the sworn testimony in this case. You must not be controlled by the last word instead of by the last argument. You must not be controlled by the last epithet instead of by the last fact. You must give to every argument, whether made by defendant or prosecution, its full and honest weight. You must put the evidence in the scales of your judgment, and your manhood must stand at the scales, and then you must have the courage to tell which side goes down and which side rises. That is all we ask. We ask the mercy of an honest verdict and of your honest opinion. We ask the mercy of a verdict born of your courage, a verdict born of your sense of justice, a verdict born of your manhood, remembering that you are the peers of any in the world. And it is for you to say, gentlemen, whether these defendants are worthy to live among their fellow citizens, whether they shall be taken from the sunshine and from the free air, and whether they are worthy to be men among men. It is for you to say whether they are to be taken from their homes, from their pursuits, from their wives, from their children, that responsibility rests upon you. It is for you to say whether they shall be clothed in dishonor, whether they shall be clad in shame, whether their day of life shall set without a star in all the future sky, that is for you. It is for you to say whether Stephen W. Dorsey, John W. Dorsey, John R. Minor, 
Thomas J. Brady, and H. M. Vale shall be branded as criminals. It is for you to say, after they have suffered what they have, after they have been pursued by this government as no defendants were ever pursued before, whether they shall be branded as criminals. It is for you to say whether their homes shall be blasted and blackened by the lightning of a false verdict. It is for you to say whether there shall be left to these defendants and to those they love a future of agony, of grief, and tears. Nothing beneath the stars of heaven is so profoundly sad as the wreck of a human being. Nothing is so profoundly mournful as a home that has been covered with shame, a wife that is worse than widowed, children worse than orphaned. Nothing in this world is so infinitely sad as a verdict that will cast a stain upon children yet unborn. It is for you to say, gentlemen, whether there shall be such a verdict, or whether there shall be a verdict in accordance with the evidence and in accordance with the law. And let me say right here that I believe the attorneys for the prosecution, eager as they are in the chase, excited with the hunt, after the sober second thought, would be a thousand times better pleased with the verdict of not guilty. Of course they want victory. They want to put in their cap the little feather of success, and they want you to give in the scales of your judgment greater weight to that feather than to the homes and wives and children of these defendants. Do not do it. Do not do it. I want a verdict in accordance with the evidence. I want a verdict in accordance with the law. I want a verdict that will relieve my clients from the agony of two years. I want a verdict that will drive the darkness from the heart of the wife. I want a verdict that will take the cloud of agony from the roof and the home. I want a verdict that will fill the coming days and nights with joy. I want a verdict that, like a splendid flower, will fill the future of their lives with a sense of thankfulness and gratitude to you, gentlemen, one and all. This ends Chapter 4, Part 23 of 24. Chapter 4, Part 24 of the Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 10, Ingersoll's Closing Address to the Jury in the Second Star Route Trial, Part 24 of 24. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in January 2019. Part 24. The Court. Let me inquire of the counsel for the defense if there are to be any other arguments upon their side. Mr. Hinkle. May it please your honor, inasmuch as I alone represent two of the defendants, it is perhaps due to this jury and to myself to explain why I do not propose to argue the case. I had prepared myself with a good deal of labor and painstaking to submit an argument to the jury, but after the exhaustive and able argument of my brother Wilson, I and my colleagues were of the opinion that there was room but for one more argument on the part of the defense, and with entire unanimity we selected our colleague, Brother Ingersoll, to make the argument. And how grandly he has justified the choice, the jury, your honor, and the spectators will determine." I saw some time ago a little paragraph in a paper in this city which represents the interest of the government, in which it was said that the defendants' counsel were afraid to argue this case because they would come in collision with each other, that each would try to throw the conspiracy at the door of the others and exonerate himself, and that therefore they were afraid to argue the case. I want to say to your honor that, so far from being afraid to argue the case, I should have been very happy to pursue the argument, so far as I am concerned. But out of tender consideration to the jury, who have been kept for six months from their business and their interests, which I know are suffering, 
we have unanimously concluded that we would close the argument with that which your honor has just heard and i simply want to say further that i not only do not antagonize with anything that has been said by my brother wilson or by my eloquent friend who has just concluded but i endorse most fully and cordially every word that has been uttered and so far as my clients are concerned gentlemen of the jury the case is with you mr davidge may it please your honor perhaps i ought to add a single word it was understood by counsel that when Colonel Ingersoll, as stated by General Hinkle, was unanimously selected to represent the defendants, that both Colonel Ingersoll and myself should have the privilege of addressing the jury, if, in the judgment of either, it should be necessary. I have felt such a deep interest in the present case that I have almost hoped he might leave unoccupied some portion of the field of argument. I have listened to every word that has fallen from his lips, he has filled the whole area of the case with such matchless ability and eloquence that i have no ground upon which i can stand in making any further argument he has so fully uncovered the origin of this so-called prosecution its methods and the character and weight of the evidence upon which a conviction is sought that i can add nothing whatever to what he has said i need not add that every syllable he has uttered receives my grateful endorsement as well as that of all the defendants and their counsel in this case the following article appeared in the sun new york june fifteenth eighteen eighty three twelve jurymen decided this morning that the government had not legally established a case of conspiracy against the star route defendants this verdict of absolute acquittal coming so unexpectedly has created a very marked sensation the announcement in the courtroom of the verdict was followed by an uproarious scene of applause tears hysterics and cheers everyone expected the jury to disagree judge wiley himself a week or ten days ago called up the counsel for the prosecution and said to them i do not think you are going to get a verdict out of that jury i have watched it carefully and i am certain that four of the best men on it are in doubt last night an employee of the department of justice reported that the jury stood eleven to one for acquittal this came from one of the bailiffs who claimed to have overheard a vote at any rate the prosecution had intended if a disagreement was reported to ask to have the jury dismissed on the ground of the condition of juror vernon had this been attempted dr sowers who attended vernon yesterday would have testified that vernon was all right mentally after he had braced him up with two drinks of brandy the courtroom was crowded when the jurors took their places every one of the defendants was there dorsey sat by his wife flushed and expectant upon the left of mrs dorsey was her sister mrs peck brady was just back of his special counsel judge wilson looking as hard and grim as ever all of the counsel for the star route defendants were in their seats colonel ingersoll's face showed great self-control although he was evidently laboring under strong nervous excitement he was flanked by his entire family mr farrell mr baker colonel ingersoll's secretary and the white-haired and white-bearded mr bush the hard-working associate of colonel ingersoll were also present when the jurors took their places in the courtroom precisely at ten o'clock judge wiley looked at them and said in his slow hesitating way gentlemen i have sent for you to learn <coughs> to learn if you have agreed <coughs> upon a verdict mr crane the foreman said we have agreed judge wiley gave a start of surprise and looked towards the seats for the counsel of the government not one of them was present this looked very ominous for the government's case and indicated besides that the bailiffs must have betrayed the secrets of the jury room to the prosecution as neither bliss nor merrick came to the courtroom at all mr kerr one of the counsel for the prosecution came in and stood in the door as the judge said to the clerk receive this verdict there was the usual silence as every one turned toward the foreman mr crane said very deliberately we find the defendants not guilty 
then there followed a scene of great confusion and uproar which the judge could not restrain indeed he did not try the triumph of such an unexpected success after two years of fighting in the face of the entire power of the government made the humblest person connected in the most remote degree with the defence crazy with joy when colonel ingersoll came out of the courthouse a crowd gathered in front of him and then one stout-lunged broad-shouldered man cried out three cheers for colonel ingersoll there was a wild scene of tiger-like cheering from the excited crowd. This demonstration was a personal compliment to the colonel, for when the defendants passed out, there was not the slightest sign of approval or disapproval beyond the congratulations of personal friends. Colonel Ingersoll stood on the broad steps of the courthouse and smiled with the benevolent air of a popular orator in front of a congenial crowd, and laughed outright when some over-enthusiastic admirer called, Speech! Speech! The morning was clear and bright. Colonel Ingersoll watched the crowd a moment, himself a picture of radiant good nature, as he stood with his white straw hat encircled with a blue band, pushed back from his face. His short, thin black coat was partially buttoned over a white duck waistcoat. He rested his hands in the pockets of his gray trousers, the request for speech speech so amused him that he chuckled over it all the way to his open carriage which came up a moment after he was driven through pennsylvania avenue with his family people called out to him from the sidewalk and he was obliged to lift his hat so much that he finally sat bareheaded like a conquering hero waving his hands to the right and to the left his house was thronged all day mrs blaine and her daughter margaret were among the first who called there was a profession of people all day long who had no sympathy at all with the defendants and who were perfectly indifferent whether they went to the penitentiary or not but who were most heartily glad that their friend colonel ingersoll had accomplished such a great personal victory now that the case is over it is time to tell some facts about the prosecution which have been withheld until the case was closed in the first place, the management of the prosecution has been equally scandalous with the crimes charged against the defendants. The district attorney here has always been allowed a $5 fee for the prosecution of cases. Attorney generals who preceded Mr. Brewster ruled that this should be the official fee of special counsel. This was made up by allowing the payment of lump sums as retainers, when Bliss and Merrick were put upon the extravagant pay of $150 per day, it was inevitable that they would prolong the case to the uttermost. Bliss has, on top of all this pay, put in an extraordinary list of personal expenses, which have been allowed up to a very recent date. The amount of extra matter running into this case, only to prolong it, has resulted in so confusing the case as to materially aid the defense. Then the reporting of the case has been turned into a huge job. The stenographers will clear between thirty and forty thousand dollars on their work. The other day I estimated from official sources the cost of the Star Route trials at one million dollars. It will go above that. It will foot up near one million two hundred thousand dollars. This evening Colonel Ingersoll was serenaded. There was a large gathering of friends of the Star Route defendants at Colonel Ingersoll's house tonight. Indoors, the acquitted men, their counsel, and a large number of their more intimate friends, many of them women, met to exchange mutual congratulations. And in the street, a crowd had gathered, partly out of curiosity and partly to express their sympathy with the defendants. They cheered Ingersoll and the other counsel as well as the defendants and the jury and called for speeches. Colonel Ingersoll and Judges Wilson and Carpenter spoke briefly. Colonel Ingersoll's speech was short and vigorous. He hailed the verdict of the jury as a victory for truth and justice, and as a notice to the administration that it could not terrorize a jury by indicting jurymen, and a warning to the president that he could not force a verdict by turning honest servants out of office. This ends Chapter 4, Part 24. And this ends Colonel Ingersoll's closing address to the jury in the second Star Route trial.
Chapter Five, Part One of the Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume Ten. Ingersoll's Address to the Jury in the Davis Will Case. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part One article printed in the anaconda standard butte montana september fifth eighteen ninety one the matchless eloquence of ingersoll where will one look for the like of it what other man living has the faculty of blending wit and humor pathos and fact and logic with such exquisite grace or with such impressive force Senator Sanders this morning begged the jury to beware of the oratory of Ingersoll as it transcended that of Greece. Sanders was not far amiss. In fierce and terrible invective, Ingersoll is not to be compared with Demosthenes. But in no other respect is Demosthenes his superior. To a modern audience, at least, Demosthenes on the crown would seem a pretty poor sort of affair by the side of Ingersoll on the Davis will. It was a great effort, and its chief greatness lay in its extreme simplicity. Ingersoll stepped up to the jurors as near as he could get, and kept slowly walking up and down before them. At times he would single out a single juryman, stop in front of him, gaze steadily into his face, and direct his remarks for a minute or two to that one man alone. Again, he would turn and address himself to Senator Sanders, Judge Dixon, or somebody else of those interested in establishing the will as genuine. At times, the gravity of the jury and the audience was so completely upset that Judge McCadden had to rap for order. But presently, the colonel would change his mood, and the audience would be hushed into deepest silence. If the jury could have retired immediately upon the conclusion of Ingersoll's argument, there is little doubt as to what the verdict would have been. If Ingersoll himself is not absolutely convinced that the will is a forgery, he certainly had the art of making people believe that he was so convinced. He said he hoped he might never win a case that he ought not to win as a matter of right and justice. The idea which he sought to convey, and which he did convey, was that he believed he was right, no matter whether he could make others believe as he did or not. In that lies Ingersoll's power. Whether by accident or design, the will got torn this morning. A piece in the form of a triangle was torn from one end. Ingersoll made quite a point this afternoon by passing the pieces around among the jury and asking each man of them to note that the ink at the torn edges had not sunk into the paper. In doing this, he adopted a conversational tone and kept pressing the point until the juror he was working on nodded his head in approval. Both Judge Dixon and Senator Sanders interrupted Ingersoll early in his speech to take exception to certain of his remarks, but the colonel's dangerous repartee and delicate art in twisting anything they might say to his own advantage soon put a stop to the interruptions, and the speaker had full sway during the rest of the time at his disposal. The crowd, it was as big as circumstances would permit, every available inch of space in the room and in the courthouse corridors being occupied, enjoyed Ingersoll's speech immensely, and only respect for the proprieties of the place prevented frequent bursts of applause as an accompaniment to the frequent bursts of eloquence. Ingersoll's Address May it please the court and gentlemen of the jury, Waving congratulations, reminiscences, and animadversions, I will proceed to the business in hand. There are two principal and important questions to be decided by you. First, is the will sought to be probated, the will of Andrew J. Davis? Is it genuine? Is it honest? And second, did Andrew J. Davis make a will after 1866, revoking all former wills, or were the provisions such that they were inconsistent with the provisions of the will of 1866? These are the questions, and as we examine them, other questions arise that have to be answered. The first question, then, is who wrote the will of 1866? Whose work is it? 
when where and by whom was it done and i don't want you gentlemen to pay any attention to what i say unless it appeals to your reason and to your good sense don't be afraid of me because i am a sinner footnote colonel ingersoll when speaking of himself as a sinner in this address is referring to the remarks made by senator sanders who in the preceding address said quote, in an old book occur the words my son if sinners entice thee consent thou not i will not apply this to you gentlemen of the jury but i have a right to demand of you that you hold your minds and hearts free from all influences calculated to swerve you until you have heard the last words in this case End quote. the senator enjoined them not to be beguiled by the eloquence of a man who was famed for his eloquence over two continents and in the islands of the sea a man whose eloquence fittingly transcended that of greece in the time of alexander and footnote i admit that i am a sinner i am not like the other gentlemen who thanked god quote, that he was not as other men end quote. I have the faults and frailties common to the human race, but in spite of being a sinner, I strive to be at least a good-natured one, and I am such a sinner that if there is any good in any other world, I am willing to share it with all the children of men. To that extent, at least, I am a sinner, and I hope, gentlemen, that you will not be prejudiced against me on that account, or decide for the proponent simply upon the perfections of Senator Sanders." now i say the question is who wrote this will the testimony offered by the proponent is that it was written by job davis we have heard a great deal gentlemen of the difference between fact and opinion there is a difference between fact and opinion but sometimes when we have to establish a fact by persons we are hardly as certain that the fact ever existed as we are of the opinion and although one swears that he saw a thing or heard a thing, we all know that the accuracy of that statement must be decided by something besides his word. There is this beautiful peculiarity in nature. A lie never fits a fact. Never. You only fit a lie with another lie, made for the express purpose, because you can change a lie, but you can't change a fact and after a while the time comes when the last lie you tell has to be fitted to a fact and right there is a bad joint consequently you must test the statements of people who say they saw not by what they say but by other facts by the surroundings by what are called probabilities by the naturalness of the statement if we only had to hear what witnesses say, jurymen would need nothing but ears. Their brains could be dispensed with. But after you hear what they say, you call a counsel in your brain and make up your mind whether the statement, in view of all the circumstances, is true or false. Did Job Davis write this will? I would be willing to risk this entire case on that one proposition. Did Job Davis write this will? and i propose to demonstrate to you by the evidence on both sides that job davis did not write that will why do i say so first the evidence of all the parties is that job davis wrote a very good hand that his letters were even he wrote a good hand a kind of schoolmaster copybook hand is this will written in that kind of hand I ask Judge Woolworth to tell you whether that is written in a clerky hand, whether it was written by a man who wrote an even hand, whether it was written by a man who closed his A's and O's, whether it was written by one who made his H's and B's different. Job Davis was a good scholar. No good penman ever wrote the body of that will. If there were nothing else, I would be satisfied, and in my judgment, you would be, that it is not the writing of Job Davis. It is the writing of a poor penman. It is the writing of a careless penman, who for that time endeavored to write a little smaller than usual. And why? When people forge a will, they write the names first on the blank paper. 
they will not write the body of the will and then forge the name to it because if they are not successful in the forgery of the name they would have to write the whole business over again so the first thing they would do would be to write the name and the next thing that they would do be to write the will so as to bring it within the space that was left and here they wrote it a little shorter even than was necessary and quit there indicating on the will and made these six or seven marks and then turned over and on the other side they were a little crowded before they got to the name of a j davis now the next question is was job davis a good speller let us be honest about it how delighted they would have been to show that he was an ignorant booby but their witnesses and our witnesses both swear that he was the best speller in the neighborhood and when they brought men from other communities to a spelling match after all had fallen on the field after the floor was covered with dead and wounded job davis stood proudly up not having missed a word he was the best speller in that county and not only so but at sixteen years of age he wasn't simply studying arithmetic he was in algebra and not only so after he had finished what you may call this common school education in salt creek township he went to the normal school of iowa and prepared himself to be a teacher and came back and taught a school now did job davis write this will senator sanders says there are three or four misspelled words in this document while the fact is there are twenty words in the document that are clearly and absolutely misspelled and what kind of words are misspelled some of the easiest and most common in the english language will you say upon your oaths that job davis having the reputation of the champion speller of the neighborhood will you upon your oaths say that when he wrote this will probably the only document of any importance if he did write it that he ever wrote he spelled shall s h a l every time it occurs in the will will you say that this champion speller spelled the word weather with two r's and made it whether making two mistakes first as to the word itself and second as to the spelling will you say that this champion speller could not spell the word dispose but wrote it depose and will you say the ordinary word give was spelled by this educated young man g u i v e and it seems that colonel sanders has ransacked the misspelled word to find somebody idiotic enough to twist a u in the word give and even in the century dictionary i suppose they call it the century dictionary because they looked a hundred years to find that peculiarity of spelling even there although give is spelled four ways besides the right way no u is there and will you say that job davis did not know the word administrators now let us be honest about this matter let us be fair it is not a personal quarrel between lawyers i never quarrel with anybody my philosophy being that everybody does as he must and if he is in bad luck and does wrong why let us pity him and if we happen to have good luck and take the path where roses bloom why let us be joyful that is my doctrine no need of fighting about these little things they are all over in a little while anyway do you believe that job davis spelled sheet a sheet of paper s h e a t that is the way he spells it in this document now let us be honor bright with each other and do not let the lawyers on the other side treat you as if you were twelve imbeciles you would better be misled by a sensible sinner than by the most pious absurdities that ever floated out from the lips of man let us have some good hard sense as we would in ordinary business life do you believe that job davis the educated young man the school teacher the one who attended the normal school would put periods in the middle of sentences and none at the end that he would put a period on one side of an n and then fearing the n might get away put one on the other 
and then when he got the sentence done be out of periods so that he could not put one there and put so many periods in the writing that it looked as if it had broken out with some kind of punctuation measles job davis an educated man and you are going to tell this jury that that man wrote the will i think your cheeks will get a little red while you are doing it this man when he comes to this little word is in the middle of a sentence his desire for equality is so great that he wishes to put the word on a level with others and starts it with a capital so that it will not be shamed to appear with longer words and yet the will was written by job davis and sconce saw him write it and mrs downey saw him write it if there were one million sconces and a million mrs downies and they held their hands up high and swore that they did i know that they did not unless all the witnesses who have testified to the education of job davis have testified lies there is where i told you a little while ago that when a lie comes in contact with a fact it will not fit these are the people in salt creek township that have come here and sworn to that did not know whether it was spelled right or wrong they did not take that into consideration it seems to me utterly absolutely infinitely impossible that this will was written by a good speller i know it was not so do you there is not a man on the jury that does not know it was not written by a good speller not a man and you cannot upon your oaths say that you believe two things first that job davis was a good speller and secondly that he wrote this will utterly impossible there is another word here wordly all my wordly goods worldly it ought to be but this job davis this scholar did not know that there was such a word as worldly he left out the l and called it wordly all my wordly goods and they want you to find on your oath that it was written by a good speller there are twenty words misspelled in this short will and the most common words some of them in the english language now i say that these twenty misspelled words are twenty witnesses Twenty witnesses that tell the truth without being on their oath, and that you cannot mix by cross-examination. Twenty witnesses. Every misspelled word holds up its maimed and mutilated hand and swears that Job Davis did not write that will. Every one. Suppose witnesses had sworn that Judge Woolworth wrote this will. How many salt creakers do you think it would take to convince you that he was around spelling sheet? s h e a t mr woolworth i have done worse than that a great many times mr ingersoll you have acted worse than that but you have never spelled worse than that now this job davis died in eighteen sixty eight nobody has seen him write for twenty-three years but everybody their witnesses and ours positively swears that he was a good speller now comes another question who wrote this will colonel sanders tells us that it is immaterial whether job davis wrote it or not to me that is a very strange remark if job davis did not write it mr sconce has sworn falsely if job davis did not write it then there was no will on the twentieth of july eighteen sixty six and all the glasgows and quigleys and downies and the rest are mistaken not one word of truth in their testimony unless job davis wrote that will and yet a learned counsel who says that his object is to assist you in finding a correct verdict says it don't make any difference whether job davis wrote the will or not i don't think it will in this case who wrote the will i am going to tell you and i am going to demonstrate it so that you need not think anything about it so that you will know it that is to say it will be a moral certainty who wrote this will i will tell you who and i have not the slightest hesitation in saying it james r eddy wrote this will and why do i say it many witnesses have sworn that they were well acquainted with mr eddy's handwriting many several of the witnesses here had the writing of eddy with them 
that writing was handed to the council on the other side so that they might frame questions for cross-examination those witnesses founded their answers as to peculiarities upon the writings given to the other side and not on the writing in this will just on the writings of letters and documents they had in their possession and that we handed to the opposite council now what do they say every witness who has testified on that subject said that eddie had this peculiarity first that whenever a word ended with the letter d he made that d separate from the rest of the word and gentlemen there are twenty-eight words in this short will ending with the letter d clearly unequivocally in twenty-seven of the words ending in d the d is separate from the rest of the word i do not include the twenty-eighth because there is a little doubt about it the testimony is unvarying except the writing that eddie has done since he has been found out to be the forger of that will nobody has sworn that he had a letter from him in which that is not a fact unless the letter was written since the institution of this suit twenty-seven of these words end with a d and the d is made separate from the rest of the word will judge woolworth please tell the jury whether any witness testified that job davis made these separate from the rest of the word poor job dead and his tombstone is being ornamented with g u i v e and he is now made to appear as an ignorant nobody twenty-eight words ending with d now if that were all i would say that might be an accident a coincidence and that we could not build upon that as a rock i would say we must go further we must find whether any more peculiarities exist in eddie's writing that also exist in this will we must be honest with him now let us see he always had the peculiarity of terminating that d abruptly down just above the line or at the line lifting his pen suddenly making no mark to the right every one of the d's in the will is made exactly that way corroboration number two these twenty-seven witnesses the d's swear that eddie is their father that they are the children of his hand that he made them another peculiarity they say that eddie always made a double l in a peculiar manner the last l came down to the line of the upstroke and that l as a rule stopped there it did not go on to the right a peculiarity now let us see in this will there are nine words that end with a double l and i want you to look at that when you go out each one is made exactly the same each one nine more witnesses that take the stand and swear to the authorship of this will has anybody shown that that was job davis's habit poor dead dust cannot swear nobody has said that another peculiarity is that eddie made a p without making any loop to the right in the middle of it now and then he makes one with a loop but his habit is to make one without moses downey swore that job davis made a p with three loops a loop at the top a loop at the bottom and a loop in the middle that is exactly what he swore and he was the one who taught job to write and he said that he made his letters carefully he closed his a's at the top he made his o's round he made his h's after the orthodox pattern he was all right on the b's your witness now gentlemen you remember how that p looks without any loop and there are twenty-one p's that have no loop to the right twenty-one in this will twenty-one more witnesses and every one of them is worth a hundred sconces with his sheep and hogs floating in the air twenty-one witnesses that swear to the paternity of this will moses downey your own witness swears that job made a p with three loops there is not a p in the will with three loops and there are twenty-one without any and evidence of all the witnesses on our side was that it was his habit to make peas without any loop and they were given the papers that they might cross-examine every one now do you see we are getting along on the edge of demonstration these things cannot conspire and happen they may in omaha but they can't in butte or even in salt creek township 
nature is substantially the same everywhere and i believe her laws are substantially the same everywhere from a grain of sand to the blazing arcturus everywhere the probabilities are the same let us take another step it is also sworn by intelligent men who have the writing of eddie in their possession writing shown to the other side that it was his habit to use a's o's and u's indiscriminately for instance t h u t that you will all remember in the will when you go out you will see it he often uses an o where an a should be an a where a u should be a u where an a or an o should be in other words he uses them interchangeably or indiscriminately how many cases of that occur in this will twenty two twenty-two instances in this will in which one of these vowels is used where another ought to have been used twenty-two more witnesses that james r eddy wrote this will twenty-two more they have taken the stand they won't have to be sworn because they can't lie it would be splendid if all witnesses were under that disability that they had to tell the truth that cannot be answered by logwood ink eddie made peas just the same whether he used logwood or nigrosin and he used his a's and o's and u's indiscriminately no matter whether he was writing in ink red blue brown iron carters arnold's stafford's or anybody else's another witness testified that he used r where he ought to use s and that he used s where he ought to use r or that he made his r's and s's the same many instances of that kind occur in this will and every r says to eddie you are the man every one every s swears that your will is a poor ignorant impudent forgery that is what it is the most ignorant forgery ever presented in a court of justice since the art of writing was invented it comes in covered with the earmarks of fraud and yet i am told that it requires audacity to say that it is a forgery what on earth does it require to say that it is genuine audacity in comparison with what is essential to say that it is genuine is rank meekness and cowardice words lose their meaning all swear that eddie scattered his periods with a liberal hand like a farmer sowing his grain now we will take the twenty-third line of the will Quote, to their use period and period benefit another period forever another period twenty fifth line quote, davis period and another period job another period davis another period of another period davis another period county another period end quote what a spendthrift of punctuation this man was and yet he was well educated studying algebra going to the normal school in iowa champion speller of the neighborhood every period certifies and swears that job davis did not write that will he had studied grammar punctuation is a part of grammar and no one but the most errant blundering stumbling ignoramus would think of putting six or eight periods along in a sentence and then leaving the end of that sentence naked without anything another peculiarity is mr eddy uses b and h interchangeably he makes a b exactly like an h makes an h exactly like a b you can see that all through the will there are several instances of it and each one says that job davis did not write it downey says he did not write that way and each one says that mr eddy did write it and nobody else this ends chapter five part one of four Chapter 5, Part 2 of the Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 10, Ingersoll's Address to the Jury in the Davis Will Case, Part 2 of 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part 2 
I am not through yet. The testimony is that Eddie was a poor speller. Now, the learned counsel, Mr. Dixon, says that in this case we must be governed by the probable, by the natural, by the reasonable. Three splendid words, and they should be in the mind of every juror when examining this testimony. Is it natural? Is it probable? Is it reasonable? We have shown that Eddie was the poorest speller in the business. Whenever they went to a spelling match, at the first fire he dropped never outlived, I think, the first volley, and one man by the name of Sharp distinctly recollects that they gave out a sentence to be spelled, quote, give alms to the poor, end quote, and Eddie had to spell the first word, give, and he lugged in his U with both ears, G-U-I-V-E, and he dropped dead the first fire. The man remembers it because it was such a curious spelling of give, and if I had heard anybody spell it with a U when I was six years old, it would linger in my memory still. Now let us take Judge Dixon's test. It is a good one, well stated, and it is for you to decide whether the misspelled words were misspelled by a good speller or a poor speller. And if you say Job Davis wrote it, then you are unnatural, unreasonable, and improbable. Isn't it altogether more natural, more reasonable, and more probable to say that a bad speller misspelled the words than that a good speller did? Let us stick to his standard and see if Eddie spelled give, G-U-I-V-E, and, gentlemen, you cannot find in all the writing of James R. Eddy, written before he was charged with this forgery, where the word give appears, that it is not written with a U, I defy you to find a line in the world where given is given. Now let us go another step. Everybody admits that he was a poor speller, and is it not more reasonable to say that he wrote the will on the spelling than that the champion speller did? We have some more evidence on Mr. Eddy, as good as anything I have stated. Now do not be misled, because I am a sinner— let us stick to the facts. William H. Davis testified to the spelling of Eddie, and while he testified, held in his hand a will that he had seen James R. Eddie write. In this will there were twenty words misspelled. Shall, S-H-A-L, and in the James Davis will, Shall, S-H-A-L. Good. Whether, in our will, W-H-E-R-T-H-E-R, in the other will, W-H-E-R-T-H-E-R, -E -E just the same. Sheet of paper, S-H-E-A-T, in our will, S-H-E-A-T, in the other will. And in our will, G-U-I-V-E, in that, G-U-I-V-E. Did Job Davis rise from the dead and write another will? Was one copied from the other, and the copy so slavish that it was misspelled exactly the same? You cannot say it was entirely copied, for now and then a word by accident is right. Judge Dixon tells you that Eddie did not disguise his spelling. Good Lord, how could he disguise his spelling? He spelled as he thought was right. No man of his education would think of disguising his spelling. He knows how to spell give. He believes it is with a U. Still, there is a prejudice against U, since he was charged with forgery, and so he has dropped it, but he thinks it is right, nevertheless. Now, isn't it perfectly wonderful? Is it not a miracle that James R. Eddy made exactly the same mistakes in spelling and writing one will that Job Davis did in writing another? Isn't it wonderful beyond the circumference of belief that a good speller and a bad speller happened to misspell the same words? It won't do. There is something rotten about this will, and the rotten thing about it is that James R. Eddy wrote it, and he wrote it about March 1890. That is when he wrote it, and he let the proponent in this case have it. We will get to that shortly. So, gentlemen, I tell you that every misspelled word is a witness in our favor. 
there is something more eddie uses the character and in writing instead of writing a n d the will is full of them and it is stated that sometimes when he endeavors to write out the word a n d he only gets a n and that peculiarity is in the will a n for a n d that you will find in the seventeenth line in the last word of the line Colonel Jacques swore that one of Eddie's misspelled words was the word judgment, that he put in a superfluous E, and in this case here is J-U-D-G-E-M-E-N-T, shall give the annuity that the judgment of the executor shall be final. There is the superfluous E, J-U-D-G-E-M-E-N-T. Now there is another their witnesses swore that as a rule he turns the bottom of his y's and g's to the left now you will find the same peculiarity in this will and the amusing peculiarity that he turns the g's a little more than he does the y's i don't want these things answered by an essay on immutable justice i want them to say how this is another thing how he makes a t with a little pot hook at the top and that hook has caught Mr. Eddy. You will find them made in the will exactly where the T commences a word, where it is what we call the initial letter. And what else? When he makes a small E commencing a word, he always makes it like a capital E, only smaller. That is the testimony, and that happens in this will, and it happens in the papers and letters. Now I say that all these peculiarities taken together, the same words misspelled, the same letters used interchangeably, the same mistakes in punctuation, the same mistakes in the words themselves, all these things amount to an absolute demonstration. So, I told you, he uses the capital I with the word is, and that he does twice in this will. Here are hundreds, almost, of witnesses that take the stand and swear that Eddie is the author of that will. He wrote it, every word of it. He negotiated with John A. Davis for it, and I will come to that after a little. And how do they support this will that has in it the internal evidence that it was written by James R. Eddie? Why do I say it is impossible that he should have written it and the will should be genuine? because at the date of that will, or the date it purports to bear, Eddie was only eight years old. And we don't know the real date, gentlemen, of that will yet. My opinion is that it was dated by mistake, so that it came on a date that Davis was not there, or came on a day that was Sunday, and then they folded up that will, and scratched it, and rubbed it until the date is absolutely illegible, and nobody can say whether it is June, July, or January. There was a purpose. The day may have been Sunday, or they may have afterward ascertained that he was not there. It is a suspicious circumstance that the day is left loose, so they can have a month to play on, maybe more. Now, they say, can you impeach sconce? Every misspelled word in the will impeaches sconce. Every period impeaches sconce. Every A that is used as O impeaches him, and O as U. Every B that is made like an H impeaches him. Every H that is made like a B impeaches him. In other words, every peculiarity of James R. Eddy that appears in that will impeaches J. C. Sconce, Sr., Captain Sconce. There is a thing about this will which to my mind is a demonstration. It may be that it is because I am a sinner, but I find, and so do you find it, in the second initial of Sconce, in the letter C, there are two punctures, and you will find that exactly where the punctures are, there is a little splatter in the ink, a disturbance of the line. In the capital first, in the small C, there is another puncture and another disturbance of the line. Professor Elwell says that these holes were made afterwards. Let's see. There is a hole, and there is a splatter and a change of the line. There is another hole, and there is another change. What is natural? 
what is reasonable what is probable it is that the whole being there interrupted the pen and accounts for the diversion of the line and for the spatter that is natural isn't it but they take the unnatural side they say that these holes were made after the writing would it not be a miracle that just three holes should happen to strike just the three places where there had been a division of the line and a little spatter of the ink take up your table of logarithms and figure away until you are blind and such an accident could not happen in as many thousand billion trillion quintillion years as you can express by figures three holes by accident hitting just the three places where the pen was impeded and where the spatters were never such a thing in the world it might happen once nobody could make me believe that it happened twice that is a hole might happen to get where the pen was interrupted once as to the second hole i would bet all i have on earth as to the third hole i know it did not i just know it did not and yet mr l wells says that these three holes were made afterwards and he goes still further and says that there is not any trouble in the line if anybody would look at it even with a natural eye they can see that there is and in a kind of diversion they called professor hagen when he called attention to it professor pinholes and pinhole expert he might have replied that that was a pinhead objection Professor Elwell accounts for all the dirt on this will by perspiration. All on one side and made by the thumb, and although there were four fingers under it at the same time, the fingers were so contrary they wouldn't perspire. This left the thumb to do all the sweating. I need not call him a professor of perspiration, for that throws no light on the subject, but I say to you, gentlemen, that those marks, those punctures, were in that paper when sconce wrote his name sconce says they were not he remembered he has got a magnificent memory i say that even shows that he is not telling the facts now what else we went round among the neighbors sconce was charged with passing counterfeit money with stealing sheep with stealing hogs with stealing cattle and with stealing harness mr woolworth speaks it was not proved that this man was accused of counterfeiting of passing counterfeit money mr ingersoll replies i tell you how i prove it a man by the name of landman was on the stand he swore he was acquainted with sconce's reputation colonel sanders asked him who he had ever heard say anything about it he said lewis miller and abraham miller and a man by the name of hopkins and several others what did they say I asked them afterwards, and among other things, I recollect he was charged with passing counterfeit money, stealing hogs, stealing sheep, stealing harness, killing another man's heifer in the woods. I don't think I am mistaken, but if I am, I will take counterfeit money back. I won't try to pass counterfeit money myself, although a sinner. Mr. Woolworth interrupts. He was not charged with killing a heifer mr ingersoll no no the heifer was there i have a very good memory i suppose it comes from the habit of taking no notes landman was the man and while we are on sconce there is a thing almost too good to be passed mr jackson was on the stand senator sanders asked him who ever told you anything against him well jackson answered i asked hopkins who else well he said i had a private conversation i don't like to tell you have got to tell mr jackson said to the court must i tell it was a private conversation you must tell well jackson said it was with mr carruthers one of the counsel for the proponent and he said that what Mr. Carruthers said had more influence upon him than anything else, because Carruthers was in a position to know. Mr. Sanders interrupts. Were those his exact words? Mr. Ingersoll. Yes, that he was an attorney. 
i tell you that was a death blow that came like thunder out of a clear sky when you haven't seen a cloud for a month besides that he was impeached in open court what else the witnesses that came to the rescue of sconce how did they rescue him they lived down there and never heard anything against him all these rumors thick in the air the bleeding of sheep following him wherever lie went the low of cattle and yet these people never heard it tried for stealing harness they never heard of it they were not acquainted with him they said that they had some personal dealings with him and he was all right and one man endeavored to draw a distinction between truth and honesty a man could be a very truthful man and a very dishonest man just think of that distinction a man of truth but dishonest that won't do even senator sanders said some accusations probably a dozen to use his excellent language what memories we have let me read the exact words Quote, some accusations probably a dozen or more of stealing sheep and hogs lit on sconce End quote. mr sanders replies i didn't say that mr ingersoll i don't insist but those are the exact words i remember and don't you remember that he went into a kind of homily on neighborhood gossip that hardly anybody escaped i believe a good many of this jury have escaped and a good many in this audience have escaped you can pick out a great many men that a dozen accusations of stealing hogs and sheep and heifers have not lit on then there is another thing about sconce that i don't like gentlemen sconce in giving the history of the affair in arkansas was asked if he didn't say quote, did i say that davis's name was on it when i signed it End quote and right there he skulked and stated under oath that when he said that he alluded to the photograph could he by any possibility have alluded to the photograph when he said quote, did i say that davis's name was on it when i signed it End quote. did he ever sign the photograph no he never signed the photograph davis never signed the photograph and if sconce ever said those words he said them with reference to the original will and he knows it and yet in your presence under oath he pretended that when he made that remark he alluded to the photograph i wish somebody would reply to that and tell us whether as a matter of fact he alluded to the photograph now mr sconce as you know has the most peculiar memory in the world he remembers things that had nothing whatever to do with the subject photographed in all details everywhere and yet gentlemen your knowledge of human nature is sufficient to tell you that that kind of memory is not the possession of any human being thousands of people imagine that detail in memory is evidence of truth i don't think it if there is something in the details that is striking then there is but naturalness and above all probability is the test of truth probability is the torch that every juryman should hold and by the light of that torch he should march to his verdict probability now let us take that for a text probability is the test of truth let us follow the natural let us follow the reasonable at the time they say this will was made andrew j davis had removed from iowa years before had settled i believe in gallatin county his interests in iowa were nothing compared with his interests in this territory at that time from the time he left iowa he began to make money i mean money of some account he began to amass wealth he was i think a sagacious man judge dixon says that he was a man of great business sagacity i am thankful for that admission in a little while he became worth several hundreds of thousands of dollars afterwards he acquired millions now during all that time from the twentieth of july eighteen sixty six up to the day of his death he never inquired after the james davis will 
it is a little curious he never wrote a letter to james davis and said where is the will have you got it not once they have not shown a letter of that kind not a word threw it in the waste-basket of forgetfulness and turned his face to montana years rolled by he never wrote about it never inquired after it they have brought no witnesses to show that a j davis ever spoke of the will not a word gentlemen let us be controlled by the natural by the reasonable by the probable in eighteen sixty eight one of the executors died job davis i think colonel sanders said that if a man of judge davis's intelligence knowing what a difficult thing a will is to write should have allowed mr knight a kentucky lawyer to draw his will who had not had much practice why he is astonished at that and in the next breath tells you that andrew j davis employed a twenty-two year old boy who could not spell give to draw up his will in eighteen sixty six isn't it wonderful what strange things people can swallow and then find fault with others now remember in eighteen sixty eight job davis died then there was only one executor to that will a j davis went on piling up his money thousands on thousands greed grew with age as it generally does gold is spurned by the young and loved by the old there is something magnificent after all about the extravagance of youth and there is something pitiful about the greed of old age but he kept getting money more and more and in eighty five he had sold the lexington mine he was then a millionaire in eighty five i think they say he sold that mine in eighty one maybe he was then a millionaire there was the will of sixty six down in salt creek township used as a model for other wills for the purpose of teaching the neighbors spelling and elocution to say nothing of punctuation they got up little will soirees down there will parties and all the neighbors came in and mrs downey read it aloud and wept when she thought it was the writing of her brother job that accounts for the teardrops i suppose the round spots on the will eighteen eighty five andrew j davis worth millions then what happened then james davis the other executor died then there was a will floating around down in salt creek township sometimes in a trunk sometimes in a box other times in an old envelope other times in a wrapper and when i think of the shadowy adventures of that document it makes me lonesome james is dead poor job nothing but dust a will down there with no executors at all and a j davis did not know in whose possession it was and never wrote to find out let us be governed by the natural gentlemen by the probable never found out never inquired and after james davis died andrew lived four years more i think james davis died on the fifth of december eighteen eighty five then andrew lived a little more than three years after he knew that both executors were dead and did not know whether the will existed or not judge dixon tells us perhaps if he had made a will before he died it would have been different from this i think perhaps it would what makes him think that it would have been different if that will existed in salt creek township he knew it and he knew it in eighteen eighty five six seven eight nine and when death touched with his icy finger his heart he knew it then and if he made that will in sixty six it was his will when he died unless it had been revoked he knew what he was doing i tell you there was no will down in salt creek township at all there wasn't any here there have been a good many since now where is the evidence that he ever thought of this will that he ever spoke of it what else he appointed three executors of his will that is in sixty six if he made it and in that he provided that a like maintenance should be given to thomas jefferson pet davis and miss burgett 
all three of van buren county state of iowa what else did he say that the executors should have the right of fixing that amount and whatever amount in their judgment should be fixed should be final what is the legal effect of that the legal effect of that is that the estate could not have passed to john a davis until the last who had a life interest was dead the proceeds could have been taken every cent of them from that estate and given to the three persons for life maintenance and the youngest of those persons was four years old john a davis would have had to wait seventeen years and do you think that a j davis ever made a will like that putting it into the power of two executors to divert the entire income to certain persons and that there could be no division until they were all dead now another improbability recollect all the time that we are to be governed by reason and naturalness now then it was claimed that judge davis held certain relations with a certain miss caroline burgett it was claimed that a daughter known as pet davis was his it was also claimed that a boy thomas jefferson davis was his son nobody tells the truth in this will although it has been alluded to and argued as well i think as could be there is this trouble in the will that though the boy jeff was never in van buren county until he was twelve years old was never there until six years after the will was dated yet his supposed father describes him as of van buren county next miss caroline burgett had married a man by the name of w v smith in eighteen fifty three and in eighteen fifty eight w v smith took his wife and children and moved to texas eight years before this will was made and yet a j davis forgot her name forgot her residence forgot the residence of the boy that was imputed to him that of itself is enough to show that he was not present when the will was made if there is anything on earth that he would remember this is it and you know it although mrs downey could not remember when she was married or when her first child was born she does remember the time it took her to dust the room where there was a clothes press a table and three or four chairs she recollects that this ends chapter five part two chapter five part three of the works of robert g ingersoll volume ten ingersoll's address to the jury in the davis will case this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana part three another improbability john a davis the proponent had charge of the davis farm down in iowa and stayed there for six years after this alleged will was made and although he was acquainted with the quigleys the henshaws the sconces and all the aristocracy of the neighborhood he says he never heard of the existence of this will which so many people of that section talked about what a place for keeping secrets senator sanders says that the reason judge davis made his will in salt creek township was because in that township they knew about this woman or these women and these children and he didn't want to go into any other community and make his will any need of publishing his will any need of reading any more than the attesting clause to the attesting witnesses any need to divulge a line none ah but senator sanders says that he wanted to keep the secret that is the reason he left the will upon that table and rode away in a debonair kind of style on his roan horse with the bobtail leaving a congregation of salt creek loafers to read his will he wanted to keep it secret hoped that it would never get out imagine the scene job davis writing the will Mrs. Downey with a duster tucked under her arm like a subret in the theater. Well, when he was writing the will, she was looking over his shoulder and read the will as fast as he wrote it. 
that makes me think of the fellow who was writing a letter and there was a man looking over his shoulder so he said i would write more but there is a dirty dog looking over my shoulder and the fellow said you are a liar everybody read it mrs downey read it she read it as job wrote it then he read it aloud and then he went and got sconce and read it again then in comes glasgow and he read it i think mrs downey must have read this will ten or twelve times mr myers remarks she said twenty-five mr ingersoll replies oh yes twenty-five because it was in job's handwriting and whenever the twilight crept around the farm bringing a little sadness a little pathetic feeling she would light a candle and hunt the will and read it just to think about job she would see the words gwiv and whirther and all that brought back job and she used to wonder whether he was in paradise or not now john a lived down there and knew all these people and he never heard of that will what do you think of that why is it that john never got any information from sconce sconce who saw the will written and who was one of the attesting witnesses why didn't he hear of it from old downey why didn't he hear of it from the Quigleys or the Dotsons? Why didn't he hear of it in Salt Creek Township when it was seen and read and read and read again until I think many of them knew it by heart? And yet the only person really interested was walking around unconscious of his great good fortune and nobody ever told him. There is another thing. For four months after Andrew J. Davis died, nobody told John about the will. Nearly four months passed away. I think Andrew died on the 11th of March, 1890, and this will came to John on the first day of July. All the neighbors knew it. Just as soon as A.J. died, they all said, John is coming right into the fortune now. Only nobody told John. And the first man we find with the will is James R. Eddy, and the next man we find with the will is John A. Davis, the proponent. When John A. Davis saw this will, leaving him four or five million dollars, it did not take much to convince him that the signature was genuine. Human nature is made that way. If it was leaving four or five millions to either of us, including this sinner who addresses you, the probability is that I would say, well, that looks pretty genuine, pretty genuine. And then, if I could get a few other fellows to swear that it was, I would feel certain and say, that is my money. Now, another improbability. All the evidence shows that Judge Davis was a businesslike, quiet, methodical, careful, suspicious man, secretive, keeping his business to himself, keeper of his own counsels, and when he did make a will, it was sealed, it was given to one of his friends and put away and to keep. It did not become the common property of the neighborhood. He did not mount his roan horse and ask the people of the community to look at it. He was a methodical, businesslike man, and I suppose many of you, gentlemen of the jury, knew him, and I shall rely somewhat on your knowledge of A.J. Davis for you to say whether he made this will, whether in 1866 he left his old father naked to the world, whether he cared nothing for brothers and sisters, whether he cared nothing for the children of the sister that raised him. I leave it for you to say. You probably know something about this matter. Andrew J. Davis, when he was a child, when all the children were gathered around the same knee, the children that had been nourished at the same tender and holy breast, he would not have done this then. If some good fortune came to one, it was divided. How beautiful the generosity, the hospitality of childhood. But as they grow old, there comes the love of gold, and the love of gold seems to have the same effect upon the heart that it does upon the country where it is found. All the roses fade, the beautiful green trees lose their leaves, and there is nothing in the heart but sagebrush. And so it is with the land that holds within the miserly grip of rocks what we call the precious metals. The next question in this case is the night will. Was any such will made? 
and i say here to-day knowing what i am saying i never saw upon the witness stand a man who appeared to be more candid more anxious and desirous of telling the exact truth than e w knight and from what i have heard there is not a man in montana with a better reputation he has no interest in this business not one penny and it was months and months after the death of judge davis that we knew such a will ever existed that is on our side either mr knight was telling what he believed to be true or he was perjuring himself no ifs and ands about it he is a man of intelligence and knows what he is saying he swears that a j davis made a will and what else does he swear to that there was also the draft of a will which gave away the mine or provided for its working and then at the end of that draft provided that the rest of the property should be divided in accordance with the statute thereupon mr knight told him quote, your heirs would interfere by injunction and you had better bequeath your whole property and fix the amount to be expended in the development of the mine End quote. thereupon a j davis made another will and that will was signed now mr knight knows whether it was signed or not the will was signed or mr knight committed perjury knowingly willfully and corruptly what does he say that it was signed what else that it was attested then these gentlemen came forward with mr talbot who says that knight said that when davis came to the bank to get the will he thought he was going to execute it that is the idea being it was not signed what was it attested for if it was not signed that is absurd to the verge of idiocy but they say that mr knight does not corroborate it let us see he says that andrew j davis made a will mr keith swears that a j davis made a will knight says that davis went out and brought keith in and keith swears that he lived next door and a j davis did come in there and get him and he knows the time on account of the sickness of his child corroboration number two knight swears that davis then went for another man keith says that he did go and get caleb irvine corroboration number three knight said one of the men who signed the will was in his working clothes corroboration number four knight swears that davis read the attesting clause keith swears the same keith swears that davis signed it that he signed it and then irvine signed it what more he swears that knight wrote it and he was writing it when he went in and yet they have and i will use an expression of one of the learned counsel the audacity to say that mr knight has not been corroborated and they would have you believe that knight took that will over to helena and put it in the safe when it was not signed by a j davis and they would make you think besides that that it was attested by two witnesses and that two witnesses had to say that they saw a j davis sign it that he signed it in their presence and that they attested his signature in his presence and in the presence of each other they proved a little too much gentlemen they proved that by talbot they proved that by andrew j davis jr who expects to fall heir to all that is taken and they proved it also by john a davis the proponent now we have a recess may it please the court and gentlemen when we adjourned i was talking about the testimony of mr knight and the making of the knight will the evidence is the way that will came to be made or what started it is as follows a j davis borrowed of the first national bank of helena forty thousand dollars to put in the mines and governor hauser remarked when he got the money quote, another old man going to fool with mines until he gets broke End quote. and that it seems piqued a j davis touched his vanity a little and then he said that mine shall be developed whether i live or die i am satisfied that it is a good mine and i am going to make a will and i am going to provide in that will for the mine to be developed End quote. and thereupon he talked with mr knight and finally knight drew up a draft of a will according to his testimony providing for the working of that mine and what did davis say when he got through with it quote, 
now as to the balance of the property let it be divided according to law that makes a good will End quote. that is what he said then mr knight said to him if you make the will that way it may be that the heirs will come in and enjoin the working of the mine on the ground that it is a waste of money you had better make a full will and dispose of all your property as you may desire and fix the amount to be used in the development of that mine End quote. now this is either true or false it is true if mr knight can be believed and he can be believed if any gentleman can be trusted what more knight says that a j davis made the memoranda from which to draw that will had his manager come and in that will it told how the shafts should be run how much work should be done and charged his trustees to do development work up to a certain amount is that all born of the fancy of this gentleman and can you believe that a man like mr knight who has run the largest bank in montana for twenty-five years can you believe that such a man who is not in any necessity who is not in need of money comes here and swears to what he knows to be a lie and makes this all out of his own head carves it out of his imagination the second will was made the second will was signed the second will was attested the second will was given mr knight to keep they say it was not signed and yet mr knight swears he told one man about it he told mr kleinschmidt so that if anything happened to him knight he would know that knight had in that vault the will of andrew j davis do you think he would have done that if the will had not been signed if it were worth only waste paper and yet they are driven to that absurdity for the purpose of attacking the evidence of this man it will not do judge knowles said in that conversation at garrison he said that in the will the mine was left to irwin davis and the reason given for it was that irwin davis was a business man now the only way that can be explained is one of two ways one is that judge knowles has gotten two matters mixed the other is that he is absolutely mistaken judge knowles the president of the first national bank of butte judge knowles who has been the attorney of andrew j davis jr judge knowles had this conversation or some conversation with knight and why would knight have taken pains to tell him a deliberate falsehood there is something more after all this occurred andrew j davis jr went to mr knight and asked him to write out what he remembered about that will and knight dictated it on the spot and sent it to him where is that letter here it is i want to read that letter to this jury that was a letter written long ago a letter written before this will was filed in this court a letter written before mr knight knew that a j davis jr had any will a letter written before knight imagined there could ever be a lawsuit on the subject andrew j davis jr went to him and asked him to write out what he knew about that will and knight turned according to his own testimony and dictated it and sent it to a j davis jr like a frank candid honest man and before i get through i will read that letter and when it is read i want you to see how it harmonizes absolutely and perfectly with his testimony here on the stand i will draw another distinction mr knight gave two depositions in this case these depositions have not been suppressed like the deposition taken of sconce not suppressed why because we are willing that the jury should read the two depositions and hear his testimony besides and there is not the slightest contradiction in the depositions themselves or between the depositions or either one of them and his evidence that he gave here except too that they claim and think what immense contradictions they are in one deposition he says that a j davis left some bequests to some aunts mr knight swears on the stand that he never said aunts he said sisters but if he did say aunts he meant sisters because he never heard of his having any aunts and yet that is held up as a contradiction and to such an extent that you are to throw away the testimony of this man now here is the letter 
this will was filed july twenty fourth eighteen ninety and when he wrote this letter he did not know that a j davis jr knew of a will or that john a davis knew of a will and this is what he writes helena montana july twenty second eighteen ninety I beg to say that sometime in 1877 or 1878, I made a draft of a will for your uncle Andrew J. Davis, which he duly executed and left the same on file with me as a special deposit for two or three years when the same was cancelled and destroyed, when I was led to believe and to conclude that he had made and executed a will to supersede and take the place of that. Ingersoll interjects that explains talbot's testimony instead of saying to talbot that a j davis came there as he thought to execute the will and destroyed that will it not being signed what he said was that he destroyed the will but from the way he acted he thought that mr davis was going to make another that he was going to execute a will and this is exactly what mr talbot said to execute a will and it took a redirect examination to swap the a for the back to knight's letter i cannot satisfactorily recall the considerations and provisions of said will drawn by me but the main burden and desire was that the work on the mine known as the lexington should be continued to a certain amount of development and that the mill should be carried on under a certain management and after providing for the payment of his just debts he made certain bequests naming certain nephews and nieces running from ten thousand to fifteen thousand dollars each and you are especially named for the sum of twenty five thousand dollars and if the estate exceeded in value the net sum of five hundred thousand dollars then those bequests were to be increased and if in excess of one million dollars the further increase was named and specified that is the letter that mr knight wrote before he ever knew that there would be this suit before he knew of the existence of this will a certain boy named jefferson claimed to be his son was given the sum of twenty thousand dollars to be paid to him in yearly sums of five thousand dollars for four years and the same provision to a certain girl claimed to be his child is that not exactly what he swore to on this stand back to knight's letter certain executors named e w knight s t hauser and w w dixon each to receive the sum of ten thousand dollars for services yours truly e w knight now gentlemen they were informed of the existence of that will and of its destruction and were so informed before john a davis filed this will and when we pleaded this will john a davis pleaded that it had been republished and yet no evidence was given in of any republication they knew that under the statute of montana when a man makes will number one and afterwards makes will number two and afterwards destroys will number two that will number one is not revived that the making of the second will kills the first and the destruction of the second kills that and leaves the man intestate and without any will now there is the letter of mr knight full free frank candid honorable like the man himself he says there that he does not remember all the provisions but he does remember that he provided for some nieces and nephews and provided for andrew j davis jr twenty five thousand dollars for one jefferson twenty thousand for the girl about the same and that he provided also for the executors of the will and appointed knight hauser and dixon as his executors that is exactly what he says here now was that will made have they impeached mr keith i tell them now that they cannot impeach him he has sworn to the making of that will apart and separate from mr knight oh they say why didn't they bring knight in and prove by him that he then recollected mr keith what has that to do with it mr keith recollected mr knight swore that knight wrote the will and that knight was writing it when he came in and swore that he attested it that davis signed it and irvine also signed it what more do we want on that will i say gentlemen that the will of eighteen eighty ends this case there is not ingenuity enough in the world to get around it 
and there never was and never will be enough brains crammed into one head to dodge it that will was made and every man on the jury knows it that will was executed by andrew j davis every man of you knows it and the will was afterwards destroyed now the question is did that second will revoke the first will had it a revoking clause in it e w knight swears it had and he swears that he copied it from a will made by an uncle of his named john knight and he had that will in his possession here and in that will there are two revocation clauses and knight swears that he copied those clauses and right here it may be well enough to make another remark when he read the will to a j davis and the passage hereby revoking all wills davis said quote, there is no need of putting that in i never made any other will this is the first End quote. knight said to him well that is the way that is the form and i think it is safer to have it that way and davis said all right let it go how do you fix that there is no way out of it that the will was made in 1880 revoking all former wills what else the conditions of the will of 1880 with regard to working the mine with regard to bequests to nephews with regard to bequests to others with regard to the twenty thousand dollars given to jeff davis and the twenty thousand dollars given to the girl these provisions are absolutely inconsistent with the provisions of this will of 1866 so on both grounds the will of eighteen eighty destroys cancels and forever renders null and void the will of eighteen sixty six even if it had been the genuine will of a j davis and the court will instruct you to that effect and after mr keith had testified the proponents in this case subpoenaed mr knight and if they thought that knight would swear that keith was not the man why did they not put him on the stand they ran no risk he is an honest man he would tell the truth i never had the slightest fear in bringing an honest man on the stand never i want facts and i hope as long as i live that i shall never win a case that i ought not win on the facts no man should wish or endeavor to win a case that he knows is wrong i say there is not a man on this jury but believes in his heart and soul this minute that this will was made you have to throw aside the testimony of the perfectly good man and no matter whether what he said about erwin davis to judge knowles was true or not and i must say that i never saw a witness on the stand in my life more eager to tell his story than judge knowles was never he was bound to get it in or die he answered questions over objections before the court was allowed to pass on the objections why because he is the president of the first national bank now without saying that he was dishonest about it i say he was mistaken knight never said one word of that kind to him it was impossible that he could have said it so is mr talbot mistaken so is andrew j davis jr mistaken and so is john a davis mistaken think of the idiotic idea that a will not signed was given to knight to keep attested by two witnesses and not signed by the testator idiotic now as i understand it gentlemen you'll have to find that that will was made this ends chapter five part three of four Chapter 5, Part 4 of the Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 10, Ingersoll's Address to the Jury in the Davis Will Case, Part 4 of 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part 4 now what is the next great question in this case and the question that will be argued at some length probably by the other side and why 
because it is the first and only point so far as facts are concerned that they have won in this case just one and what is that our experts said that they thought that the ink was nigrosin ink and the fact that they wanted a test proves that they were sincere their witnesses said that they did not think it was nigrosin ink mr hodges said that it had too much luster but that there was only one way in which it could be absolutely determined and that was by a chemical test but say these gentlemen or rather said judge dixon the moment that ink turned red the whole case of the contestants was wrecked let us see if there had been no logwood ink in existence not a particle after the twentieth day of july eighteen sixty six if on the night of july twentieth eighteen sixty six all the logwood ink on the earth had been destroyed and then this ink had turned out to be logwood why of course it would have been a demonstration that this paper was written as far back as the twentieth of july eighteen sixty six if it had turned out that it was written in nigrosin ink and that that had only been invented in eighteen seventy eight it would have been a demonstration that the will was a forgery but you must recollect the fact that it is written in logwood ink and is not only consistent with its genuineness but consistent with its being a forgery why there was logwood ink in existence in eighteen ninety plenty of it and if mr eddy wrote this will in eighteen ninety he could have written it in logwood ink and the fact that it is written in logwood ink does not show that it was written in eighteen sixty six why because there was logwood ink in existence every year since eighteen sixty six till now suppose i said that the paper was only ten years old and it turned out that it was forty is that a demonstration in favor of the other side if it turned out to be ten is it a demonstration on our side but if it turned out to be forty is not that consistent with the genuineness of the instrument and also with the spuriousness of the same instrument you can see that nobody's smart enough to fool you on that nobody take the whole question of ink out and the question is still whether eddy wrote it or not take the ink all out and it is still the question whether job davis wrote it or not absolutely and all the test proved was that our experts some of them were mistaken about its being nigrosin ink mr tolman stated that it was impossible to tell without a chemical test that it looked like nigrosin ink and from the manner in which it seemed to run he thought it was nigrosin ink but that it was impossible to tell without a test mr hodges their expert said it looked to him like logwood ink that it had too much luster for nigrosin but he added that it was impossible to tell without a chemical test that is what he said mr ames said the same thing and i appeal to you gentlemen if mr ames did not have the appearance of an honest of a candid and of a fair man professor hagen said that it was nigrosin ink but he admitted that the only way to know was to test it and what else their own expert mr hodges said that logwood ink penetrates the paper if this ink has been on here twenty-five years it penetrates the paper sometimes an accident happens in our favor a piece of that will was torn off this morning you see the edge there torn off slanting you see the o f how much that ink has sunk into the paper not the millionth part of a hair it lies dead upon the top just see how the ink went in there not a particle it lies right on top i would call that float there is the other edge there is where the ink stops it has not entered a particle and when you go to your room i want you to look at it that ink has not penetrated a particle and let us see what this witness hodges said logwood ink penetrates the paper there it is to determine the nature of the ink use hydrochloric acid what else i think this will was written with rimal's ink and that was made in germany in the neighborhood of eighteen forty rimal's ink penetrates the paper 
and then they say that we endeavor to draw a distinction between modern and ancient this is what mr hodges says about it on the addition of hydrochloric acid to logwood ink it will turn to a bright red the old-fashioned ink was manufactured by mixing a decoction of logwood with chromide of potash and formed a blue-black solution logwood inks as made today differ from those in that the modern logwood inks contain another sort of chrome than chromide of potash they contain chromium in the form of an acetate or a chlorine hodges was the man that talked about ancient and modern logwood inks and he before the test was made said that the old logwood ink would turn a bright red modern logwood not so bright and after the evidence was all in professor elwell came smilingly to the post and said they have got it exactly wrong and too the older the duller and the newer the brighter and after a moment said this was kind of dull before the test was made mr tolman swore quote, i agree with professor hodges that if it is an old logwood ink it will turn a bright scarlet red in the case of modern logwood inks i don't agree with him but to that extent i think his tests are good End quote. and he drew that distinction before the test was made gentlemen you saw this will i want to call your attention to it again you see that j in sconce's name that is pretty red not so awfully scarlet though that it would affect a turkey gobbler you see it in job you see it in james davis but there it is brown and not red and not scarlet and no flame in it and professor hodges himself said that although both were logwood inks he would not swear that job davis and james davis were written with the same ink do you see the red in that job now find the red on that s of james he said he would not swear that they were written in the same ink but both in logwood ink that is to say they might have been different inks while i would not swear that they were the same inks i would swear that both inks contained logwood and that is all he swore to and i must say that i believe he was a perfectly honest fair gentleman now all that the ink test proves on earth is that it is logwood instead of nigrosin and that does not prove that eddie did not write the will because there was plenty of logwood ink when he did write it that is the kind of ink he used and it has no more bearing the fact that it turned out to be logwood to show that it is a genuine will than though it had turned out to be iron ink suppose the experts had been wrong on both sides and it had turned out to be iron ink what would have happened then is it a genuine will nothing can be more absurd than to argue that that test settled the genuineness of this will hodges says another thing that perhaps the pen went to the bottom of the ink bottle and got a little of the settlings of the ink on it when he wrote james davis and consequently that it has a different color well if the pen had gotten some of this sediment on it the more sediment the more logwood and the more logwood the brighter the color instead of that it is dull there is another trouble with regard to the experts while undoubtedly there are some men who do not swear to the exact truth whether paid or not undoubtedly some men swear truthfully who are paid i do not believe that you doubt the testimony of hodges simply because you paid him so much a day i don't and certainly we have found no men philanthropic enough to go around the country swearing for nothing i judge of a man's oath not by what he is paid but by the manner in which he gives his testimony by the reason there is behind it that is the way i judge and yet senator sanders judges otherwise as he told you in a burst of montana zeal i like montana too and i believe the montana people are big enough and broad enough not to have prejudice against a man because he comes from another state 
every state in this union is represented in montana and the people who left the old settled states and came out to the new territories dropped their prejudices on the way and sometimes i have thought that that is what killed the grass <laughs> I like a good brave free candid chivalric people i don't care where you come from i don't care where you were born we are all men and we all have our rights and as long as the old flag floats over me i have just as many rights in montana as i have in new york and when you come to new york i will see that you have as many rights if you are in my neighborhood as you have in montana that is the kind of nationality i believe in i hate this little provincial prejudice and yet senator sanders invoked that prejudice that insults you we did not insult you when we asked you when you went on the jury if you cared whether the money stayed in butte or not or whether you are interested or not or related or not those were the questions asked every juror and we relied absolutely on your answers when you said that you were unprejudiced and that you would give us a fair trial and we believe you will now then with regard to these experts you have got to judge each one by his testimony and it is foolish it seems to me to call them vipers and pirates as senator sanders did a very strong expression vipers pirates living off he said the substance of others and yet he had an expert on the stand mr dickinson he had another mr elwell he had another mr hodges and after that he rises up before this jury and calls them three vipers and three pirates i never will do that if i ask a man to swear for me and he does the best he can i will leave the pirate out I will drop the viper, and I will stand by him if I think he is telling the truth, and if he is not, I won't say much about him. I don't want to hurt his feelings, but I want to call your attention again to the fact that every expert on our side swore, knowing that they had three experts on the other side, and that if we make a mistake, they could catch us in it, and we did make a mistake in that ink, and the test showed that we made a mistake and that is all the test did show but it did not show that the will is genuine any more than if it had turned out to be carbon ink then both sides would have been mistaken and yet after all it did turn out to be modern logwood ink and it did turn out not to be rimal's logwood ink made of the chromate of potassium did turn out not to be that and i say on this will that there is an absolute decided and distinct difference between the color on the name job davis and the name james davis and right here i might as well say that the man jackson who came here from boulder montana and when i said butler was a pretty tough place rose up in his wrath and said it was as good as new york any day that man says that when he saw the will he does not remember of seeing the names of james davis and sconce on it but he did remember of seeing the name of job davis i don't think he saw any of it now there is another question here because i have said enough about ink at least enough to give you an inkling of my views there is another question why didn't john a davis take the stand that is a serious question john a davis had sworn on the thirteenth day of march eighteen ninety that his brother died without a will john a davis on the twenty-fourth day of july eighteen ninety filed a will in which he was the legatee that will came into his possession under suspicious circumstances what would a perfectly frank and candid man have done what would you have done you would not have allowed yourself to remain under suspicion one moment you would have said i got that will so and so you would have let in the light i obtained it in such a place it is an honest genuine will and here it is and here are the witnesses to that will but instead of that john a davis never opened his mouth except to file a petition swearing that it came into his possession on the first day of july he knew that he was suspected didn't he 
he knew that the men in whose vein his blood flowed believed that the will was a forgery knew that good men and women believed that he was a robber and that he was endeavoring to steal their portion he knew that and any man that loves his own reputation and any man that ever felt the glow of honor in his heart one moment would not have been willing to rest under such a suspicion or under such an imputation he would have said here is its history here is where i got it it is not a forged will it is genuine here are the witnesses that know all about it here is how i came into possession of it no sir not a word speechless tongueless and he comes into this court and comes on this stand to be a witness and is asked about a conversation he had with burchett and then we asked him, quote, how did you come into possession of that will? All his lawyers leaped between him and the answer to that question. They objected. If he came by that will honestly, he would have said, I am going to tell you the whole story. He wants you to believe that he came by it honestly, doesn't he? He wants you to believe it. He not only wants you to believe it, gentlemen, but he asks twelve men, you, you, to swear that he came by it honestly, doesn't he? If you give your verdict that that is a genuine will, then you give your oath that John A. Davis came by it honestly, and he wants you twelve men to swear it. And that he dare not swear it himself, he wants you to do the swearing. He is afraid to stand in your presence and tell the history of that will. He is afraid to tell the name of the man from whom he received it. He is afraid to tell how much he gave for it, afraid to tell how much he promised. He is afraid to tell how they obtained witnesses to substantiate it in the way they have. Well, now, ought not you to let him tell his own story? Ought not you gentlemen to be clever enough to let him do his own swearing? Now, I will ask you again, if he came by that will honestly, fairly, above board, would he not be glad to tell you the story? Would he not be glad to make it plain to you? If that was a perfectly honest will and came to him through perfectly pure channels, would he not want you to know it? Would he not want every man and woman in this city to know it? Would he not want all his neighbors to know it? and yet he is willing when this case is being tried and when he is on the stand and asked how he got the will he is willing to close his mouth willing to admit that he is afraid to tell and i tell you today gentlemen that the silence of john a davis is a confession of guilt and he knows it and his attorneys know it a client afraid to swear that he did not forge a will or have it forged and then want to hire a man to defend him and call him honest well he would have to hire him he would not get anybody for nothing and yet he is asking you to do it if john a davis came properly by it let him say so under oath don't you swear to it for him not one of you now there is another question why did not james r eddy take the stand we charged him with forging the will we made an affidavit setting forth that he did forge the will and in this very court mr dixon arose and said he was glad that the charge had been fixed and the man had been designated judge dixon said here before this jury when this case was opened quote, the man who was charged with forging this will will be here he will stand before this jury face to face, and he will explain his connections with the will to your satisfaction. End quote. That is what Judge Dixon said. Where is your witness? Where is James R. Eddy? Why did you not bring him forward? I know he is here now, delighted with the notoriety that this charge of forgery gives him, with a moral stature that is an abyss of shallowness, delighted to be charged with it and he will probably be my friend as long as he lives because i have added to his notoriety by saying he is a forger why did they not bring him on the stand mr dixon gives one reason because the jury would not believe him 
and that is the man who is first found in possession of this will that is the man in whose hands it is and it is from that man that john a davis received it and the reason that he is not put on the stand is that it is the deliberate opinion of the learned counsel in this case that no jury would believe him how does that work with you james r eddy here his deposition here and they could not read his deposition because he was here and they had him here and kept him here so that we could not read his deposition they were bound that he should not go on the stand why because the moment he got there he could be asked where did you find the will who was present when you found it when did you first tell anybody about it when did you first show it to john a davis how much did he agree to give you for it what witnesses have you talked to in this case what witnesses have you written to in this case what work have you done in this case what affidavits have you made in this case and what have you done with the other three wills that you have in this case such questions might be asked him and they were afraid to put him on the stand every letter that he had written would have been identified by him if he had been put on the stand maybe he would have been compelled to write in the presence of the jury to see whether he would spell words correctly they knew that the moment he went on the stand their case was as dead as julius caesar they knew it and kept him off now there is only one way for them to win this case and that is to keep out the evidence only one way to win the case suppress john a davis keep your mouth closed or defeat will leap out of it eddie keep still don't let anything be seen that will throw any light upon this i ask you gentlemen of the jury to take cognizance of what has been done in this case who is it that has tried to get the light who is it that has tried to get the evidence who is it that has objected who is it that wants you to try this case in the dark who is it that wants you to guess on your oaths the failure of eddie to testify is a confession of guilt they dare not put him on the stand dare not now gentlemen there is a little more evidence in this case to which i am going to call your attention something has been said about a conversation in march eighteen ninety one sconce had his deposition taken in bloomfield iowa that deposition has been suppressed john a davis was there at the time it was taken john a davis and sconce went into the passage leading up to the office of carruthers mr burchett sheriff of the county a man having no possible earthly or heavenly interest in this business happened to stop at the corner to read his paper looked at it as he opened it and he then and there heard john a davis say quote, stick to that story and i will see that you get all the money you have been promised End quote. and thereupon sconce replied quote, all right i'll do it End quote. sconce denies it and that denial is not worth the breath that he wasted in forming the denial john a davis denies it of course he denies it but he dare not tell where he got that will he dare not do it he wants you to do that for him he wants you to lift him out of the gutter and wash the mud off him he is afraid to do it himself i want to call your attention to that conversation and that of itself is enough to impeach sconce that is enough of itself to show that john a davis was entering into a conspiracy or rather had entered into one with mr sconce now gentlemen there is another thing and we must not forget it curious people down in salt creek township on the other side of course there are plenty of good men there or the township could not exist and we had a good many of them here good straight honest intelligent looking men but the other side had some all in the family all of them 
swain he was not in the family but he is a clerk in trimble's bank where wallace is the cashier where they suppress depositions say they are not finished when they are signed by the person who swears to them john c sconce the only living witness whose ancient but ignoble blood has crept through rascals ever since the flood cousin to james davis cousin to job davis cousin to mrs downey cousin to eddie cousin to dr downey by marriage brother to t j sconce jr brother-in-law to abe wilkinson cousin to tom glasgow and sam cousin to moses davis cousin to alex davis uncle to henshaw's daughter and father-in-law of george quigley every one of them united blood is thicker than water eddie stuck to his family james r eddie cousin to sconce son of mrs downey mrs downey the duster lady who remembers that david asked her to remain but didn't ask her advice didn't have her sign the will didn't give her any bequest but there she was with her duster james r eddy grandson of james davis nephew of job davis and related by blood or marriage to both the glasgows moses and alexander davis to t j sconce and j c sconce jr abe wilkinson george quigley s m henshaw the celebrated lawyer j l hughes and eli dye brother-in-law to c o hughes and foster brother to john lyle and mrs a s bishop and it is just lovely about john lyle john lyle is one of the fellows that saw this will how did you come to see it john james davis he says was my guardian and he had to give a bond and so one day when james davis was away from home i thought i would go and see the bond of course he thought james davis kept the bond that he gave to somebody else to the county judge but mr lyle pretends that he thought the bond would be in the possession of the man who gave it and so he sneaked in and looked among the papers now do you believe such a story that he thought that man had the bond didn't he know that the bond was given to somebody else foolish bishop swears the same thing james davis was guardian for his wife and he was looking to see if james had the bond and another fellow by the name of sconce was looking for a note and when he opened this double sheet of paper folded four times and happened to see sconce's name he said here it is a promissory note mary ann davis that is to say mrs eddy that is to say mrs downey is the mother of j r eddy daughter of james davis sister to job second cousin to sconce wife of downey and related by blood or marriage to tom and sam glasgow moses and alexander davis abe wilkinson s m henshaw j c sconce jr t j sconce george quigley and c o hughes all right in there woven together e h downey son-in-law of james davis brother-in-law of job husband of mary ann davis eddie downey and stepfather of mr eddie j c sconce jr cousin to eddie nephew of j c sconce senior cousin to mrs downey cousin of e h downey son-in-law of henshaw cousin to george quigley related to tom and sam glasgow abe wilkinson and moses and alex davis george quigley son-in-law of sconce sam glasgow cousin of sconce son-in-law of die brother to tom glasgow brother-in-law to moses and alex davis cousin to abe wilkinson and related by marriage to j r eddy here they are same blood all have the same kind of memory runs in the blood henshaw father-in-law to j c sconce jr lyle adopted son of james davis and his ward and foster brother to eddie a s bishop married to ollie lyle ward of james davis foster sister of james r eddie t j sconce eddie's cousin j r sconce's brother brother-in-law and cousin to the glasgows cousin to alex and moses davis 
brother-in-law to Abe Wilkinson, and uncle to J. C. Sconce, Jr. Moses Davis, cousin of Sconce, brother-in-law to the Glasgows, cousin to Abe Wilkinson, brother of Alex Davis, and related to Eddie and Arthur Quigley. Alexander Davis, cousin to Sconce, brother of Moses Davis, brother-in-law to the Glasgows, cousin to Wilkinson, and related by marriage to Arthur Quigley. Abe Wilkinson, brother-in-law to Sconce, cousin to Alex and Moses Davis, and cousin to the Glasgows. Tom Glasgow, cousin to Sconce, and Abe Wilkinson, and a brother-in-law of Moses Davis, and a brother to Sam Glasgow, and related by marriage to Eddie. Arthur Quigley, brother-in-law to Alex Davis, and brother to George Quigley, who was a son-in-law of Sconce. John L. Hughes, his nephew married Eddie's wife's sister. Eli Dye, father-in-law of Sam Glasgow. <laughs> there they are, all of them related except Swain and Duckworth and Taylor, and Duckworth, he is in the tie business along with Eddie. There is the family tree, all growing on the same tree, and there is a wonderful likeness in the fruit. Why, that Glasgow has as good a memory as Sconce. He remembers that this is the same will he saw paper like that, and he swears, I think it is Sam Glasgow, that he did not read the contents or see a signature. And yet he comes here twenty-five years afterwards and swears it is the same paper. And then the paper was clean, and now it is covered with all kinds and sorts of stains. Now, gentlemen, take this signature of A.J. Davis and I want you all to look at it. I say it is made of pieces. I say it is a patchwork. It is a dead signature. It has no personality, no vitality in it, and I want you to look at it and look at it carefully. I say it is made of pieces. Of course, every counterfeit that is worth anything looks like the original, and the nearer it looks like the original, the better the counterfeit. All the witnesses on the side of the proponent who have sworn that it is his signature also swear that he wrote a rapid, firm hand, nervous, bold, free, and that he scarcely ever took his pen from the paper from the time he commenced his name until he finished. And I want you to look at that name. I will risk your sense. I will risk your judgment, honest, fair, and free, whether that is a made signature or whether it is the honest signature of any human being. And now, gentlemen, one word more. I contend, first, that the evidence shows beyond all doubt that Job Davis did not write this will. Second, that it is shown beyond all doubt that James R. Eddy did write this will, and that that evidence amounts to a demonstration. I claim that the will of 1880 was made precisely as E. W. Knight and Mr. Keith swear, that that will was utterly inconsistent with the will of 1866, even if that had been genuine, that it revokes that will, that its provisions were inconsistent, and that afterwards that will was destroyed, and that there is not one particle of evidence beneath the canopy of heaven to show that it was not made and to show that it was not destroyed." And the court will instruct you that the will of 1866, even if genuine, is not revived. That is the end of the case. So I claim that the probabilities, the reason, the naturalness are all on the side of the contestants in this claim. All. And I tell you that if the evidence can be depended on at all, A.J. Davis went to his grave with the idea that the law made a will good enough for him. Do you believe, if he were here, if he had a voice, that he would take this property and give it to John A. Davis, that he would leave out the children of the very woman who raised him, that he would leave out his other sisters, that he would leave out the children of his sisters and brothers? Do you believe it? I know that not one man on that jury believes it. 
this case is in your hands that property is in your hands all the millions however many there may be are in your hands they are to be disposed of by you under instructions from the court as to the law you are to do it and do you know there is no prouder position in the world there is no more splendid thing than to be in a place where you can do justice above everybody and above everything should be the idea of justice and whenever a man happens to sit on a jury in a case like this or in any other important case he ought to congratulate himself that he has the opportunity of showing first that he is a man and second of doing what in his judgment ought to be done and there will never be a prouder recollection come to you hereafter than that you did your honest duty in this case say to this proponent if you wanted to show us that you got this will honestly why didn't you swear it if you wanted us to believe it was a genuine will why didn't you have the nerve to take your oath that it is a genuine will now you have the opportunity gentlemen of doing what is right your prejudice has been appealed to but i say that you have the manhood that you have the intelligence and that you have the honesty to do exactly what you believe to be right and whether you agree with me or not i shall not call in question your integrity or your manhood i am generous enough to allow for differences of opinion but when you come to make up your verdict i implore you to demand of yourselves the reasons to be guided by what is natural to be guided by what is reasonable i want you to find that this will was found in the possession of eddie in april or march next in the hands of john a davis and that john a davis dare not tell how he came in possession of it john a davis on the edge of the grave for this world but a few days and according to the law without that will he could have had an income of over fifty thousand a year he was not satisfied with that he wanted to take from his own brothers and sisters wanted to leave his own blood in beggary he never saw the time in his life that he could earn five thousand a year never and he was not satisfied with fifty thousand he wanted four and a half million for himself gentlemen i want you to do justice between all these heirs i want you to show to the united states that you have the manhood that you are free from prejudice that you are influenced only by the facts only by the evidence and that being so influenced you give a perfectly fair verdict a verdict that you will be proud of as long as you live how would you feel to find a verdict here that this is a good will and afterwards have it turn out to be what it is an impudent ignorant forgery now all i ask of you is to take this evidence into consideration don't be misled even by a christian or by a sinner for that matter let us be absolutely honest with each other we have been together for several weeks we have gotten tolerably well acquainted i have tried to treat everybody fairly and kindly and i have tried to do so in this address i have had hard work to keep within certain limits there would words get into my mouth and insist on coming out but i said go away go away i don't want to hurt people's feelings if i can help it i don't want anyone unnecessarily humiliated but i say whatever stands between you and justice must give way and if you have to walk over reputations and if they become pavement you cannot help it you must do exactly what is right and let those who have done wrong bear the consequences now gentlemen i have confidence in you i have confidence in this verdict i think i know what it will be it will be that the will is spurious and that the will of eighteen eighty revoked it whether spurious or not that is my judgment and i don't think there is any man in the world smart enough or ingenious enough to get any other verdict from you as long as john a davis was afraid to answer that it was an honest will as long as james r eddy the forger dare not take the stand and they will never get a verdict in this world without taking the stand and if they do take it that is the end there is where they are now all i ask in the world as i said is a fair honest impartial verdict at your hands that i expect more than that i do not ask 
and now gentlemen i may never see you again after this trial is over separated we may be for ever but i want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the attention you have paid to the evidence in this case and for the patient hearing you have given me note the jury disagreed and the case was compromised this ends ingersoll's address to the jury in the davis will case Chapter 6 of the Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 10. Ingersoll's Argument Before the Vice-Chancellor in the Russell Case. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 6 russell versus russell before martin p gray v c camden new jersey june twenty first eighteen ninety nine this was colonel ingersoll's last appearance in public the report of this argument has been made from the stenographer's notes and therefore of necessity incomplete it was delivered without notes and the proofs were not seen or corrected by the author no decision in this case has as yet been rendered as of august first nineteen hundred ingersoll's argument if your honor please i agree with mr pancoast at least in one remark that he made i think about the only one that john russell is dead i think there is no controversy about that but as to the other remarks made and the positions taken by him i fail to agree in the first place for several hundred years the courts of england and for more than a hundred years the courts of this country have very jealously guarded the right of dower and wherever a woman has by antinuptial agreement given up her right of dower all the courts have decided and i know of no exception and mr pancoast has brought forward none that at the time she made the contract waiving her dower she must have been in the possession of all of the facts so that she could act with absolutely full knowledge and where a man seeks to make an agreement by virtue of which the wife or the supposed wife shall waive her dower decision after decision says that he must tell the truth and the whole truth and that it is just as fraudulent to suppress a fact as to manufacture one he must tell the absolute truth the relation of the parties is such and the dower right is such that the courts will not take the right away from the woman unless she gives it freely and at the time she gives it knows all the facts bearing upon the question as to whether she should or should not release or waive her dower now on that same line the courts have taken another step they do not put upon the wife the burden of showing that the husband was guilty of fraud directly they simply put the burden upon the wife of showing what his property was and what the consideration was in the agreement and then the court steps forward and says that if the amount is disproportionate when you take into consideration his wealth then the burden is immediately shifted and the person seeking something under his will or seeking his property must show that when the woman signed the antinuptial agreement she had been put in possession of all the facts that she then knew and knew from him what he was worth and that if she did not and the amount in the agreement is disproportionate to his estate the agreement is null and void then gentlemen who represented the heirs of the testator or the legatees said well it was generally known that he was a rich man that was his reputation in the neighborhood and she if she had taken any pains or acted with reasonable discretion could have ascertained the fact the court then took another step in advance and said that it was not her duty she was not bound to inquire as to his wealth and yet mr pancoast talks as though the maxim of caveat emptor applies in this business 
as though it had been a bargain between two sharpers she making what she could out of his admiration and he cheapening her to the extent of his power driving the best possible bargain saying that she should have looked out for her rights that she should have investigated and found out about his property that she should have called in a detective to ascertain what it was and that the courtship should have been carried on in that commercial spirit but the law says no she is not obliged to ask a question she is not obliged to take into consideration anything that is said in the neighborhood she relies upon one source for her information and that is the man whom she is going to marry and the law says he shall meet her with perfect candor and there shall pass from his lips nothing but words of truth and then if being in full possession of all the truth she makes the contract that contract shall stand otherwise that it shall not there is no use of my quoting these decisions there is no decision any other way the first question that arises is as to the condition of this contract under evidence this anti-nuptial contract is the amount disproportionate to his estate if we are to try this case relying on the notions of mr russell and say that his opinion shall govern why it may be said that russell imagined that he was generous that would be astonishing but hardly as astonishing as the fact that mr pancoast thinks he is generous mr pancoast you don't know me very well mr ingersoll i don't think you would do so badly as that it may be that russell imagined that one thousand dollars in stock of some bank was a liberal provision in his will i don't know whether he did and i do not care whether he did or not the question is not for mr russell it is not a question for mr pancoast and it is not a question for myself it is for your honor to decide is the amount mentioned in this antinuptial contract taken together if you please with the fifteen hundred dollars in the will is the amount made by the addition of the two amounts disproportionate to this estate there is a case here from illinois achilles versus achilles which ought to be a strong case in which i believe the man was worth seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars and my recollection is that he provided an annuity of three hundred dollars for his wife with rent free of a house also rent free of a vacant lot for a garden that is what he gave her what would be about four hundred dollars or five hundred dollars a year and he had eighteen thousand dollars the supreme court of illinois thought that amount so disproportionate to the value of the estate that the provision was set aside now in this case five thousand dollars or six thousand dollars we will say five thousand anyhow is the amount and there is an estate worth a quarter of a million or to come even within their own testimony worth two hundred thousand dollars the first question for your honor to decide is whether that amount is so disproportionate to his estate that unless the other side show that she was put in possession of all the facts it must be set aside the defendants in this case have not endeavored to show that mr russell ever informed the complainant what he was worth the only evidence we have on that point is what he said with regard to his poverty not one word about how much he had and as to his poverty only indirectly and here is the way the old man's mind worked they were first engaged to be married mr pancoast believes or at least he has expressed himself as though he thought that a man of seventy-five could not be in love i do not know what his experience is but i hope no fate like that will overtake me and that a woman of fifty could not feel the tender flame i do not know enough about biology to state with accuracy how that is but i heard a story once about a colored woman having lived to be a hundred and twenty-five and a man interested in the question that mr pancoast has raised asked this aged lady how old a woman had to be before she ceased to have thoughts about love and the old woman said i don't know honey you will have to ask somebody older than i is and i guess that is about the experience of the race mr russell said to this woman i want to make a contract with you and i will give you fifteen thousand dollars she said that was satisfactory and russell having a little semitic blood in his veins i guess 
said to himself i must have offered too much she accepted so readily so the next time he saw her he said i do not think i can make it more than ten thousand dollars well she said all right ten thousand dollars will do in the meantime he was getting a little older and the last time he came he said he could not make it more than five thousand dollars because his estate was so entangled that he did not know that he would be able to pay it that it would be a pretty difficult job to pay that amount within six months well she accepted and in order that she should accept it he said that in addition he would provide well for her in his will that he would make a liberal provision there is the contract no evidence in the world that he told her what he was worth the only evidence is that he pleaded poverty and right at this point i say that all the decisions i know of declare the contract void unless the defence on their part show that she was put in full possession of all the facts and that the defence in this case did not do now so far as this contract is concerned on the evidence it is void and void notwithstanding the fact that the trustees paid her five hundred dollars and mr pancoast according to my recollection is mistaken when he says that she demanded the balance he offered her the balance and she stated that she had been informed that she had some rights against the estate and therefore refused to receive it that is the fact about it he sent her five hundred dollars and wanted to send her the balance but she would not have it then he asked her to take it and showed her a receipt to be signed in which she waived everything and she refused to sign it under those circumstances i do not think it is possible for your honor to say that she has been stopped the next point raised by mr pancoast is that the oral agreement to provide well for her in the will is void under the statute of frauds well i am free to say that i do not know how it is in new jersey but in every other state in which i am acquainted with the law the statute of frauds to be operative must always be pleaded i do not know how it is here that statute has not been pleaded in this case and i never heard of it until the argument today. if it is to be pleaded before it can be invoked it is too late to cite it now but let us go on the supposition that he is right that the antinuptial contract is void and that the other contract to provide for her in the will is also void then where does that leave us that leaves us exactly as though no contract had been made that leaves us without any antinuptial contract without any agreement to provide liberally for her in the will then what is our condition then the wife is entitled to her dower in the real estate that follows as a necessity she loses her interest in the personality because that is given away by the will but if the antinuptial contract and the parole agreement are both dead one because disproportionate to the estate and because of the fraud of russell and the other on account of the statute of frauds then she is left with her dower in the real estate it is impossible it seems to me to arrive at any other conclusion it certainly would be inequitable to say that she had been stopped on account of what was done with the five thousand dollars in the hands of the trustees there is another view of it there has been if the contracts are good a partial performance and that of itself would take it out of the statute of frauds then the question is if it is out of the statute of frauds and if it is out because the contract has been partially performed the next question and it seems to me the only question that arises is has a court of equity the right to determine what the words you shall be well provided for i will provide for you liberally in my will or i will make a liberal provision for you in my will what those words mean according to the idea of counsel on the other side the court is bound to decide according to the meaning that was in the mind of mr russell but there comes in here another principle the only way we can find the meaning in his mind is by finding the words that he used and we are not to import his meanness into the words if he had meanness neither would we import his generosity if he had generosity 
we would give to those words their natural meaning apart from the thought of the one who used them and apart from the thought of the one who heard them because the words are known their meaning is known and can be ascertained by the court now the word reasonable is about as hard a word to define as a court was ever called upon to define and yet courts of law and courts of equity in hundreds and thousands of instances have passed upon the meaning of the word reasonable and have not only passed upon its meaning but have given it from time to time definitions a man must give reasonable care to the property of another given into his keeping well what is reasonable care is it reasonable for him to take such care of it as he does of his own not if he is unreasonably careless of his own and the law takes another step it says you must take such care of it as is reasonable as a reasonable man would and the courts then go on to define what a reasonable man under the circumstances would do now there is no word in the language that courts have been called upon to define that is vaguer where the line between dawn and dusk between light and dawn has to be drawn with greater care or greater intelligence than the word reasonable the word appropriate has been decided again and again the word necessary the word convenient the word suitable suitable to his or her condition in life suitable to the condition of the party all these words have been given judicial meaning hundreds and thousands of times and now we come to the word liberal is that a hard word to define everybody in the world has his notion of what liberal means given the circumstances and the actions of the man and every one you meet is ready to decide whether he is liberal or illiberal a man loses his pocketbook five thousand dollars in it a boy finds it returns it to him and he gives the boy five cents there is not a man in the world no matter whether he is a judge or not who would say that was liberal nobody if there was only a dollar in the pocketbook and he gave him half of it you would say that he was liberal you would have to take the circumstances into consideration you also take into consideration the circumstances of the man who found it if he is a poor man you cannot be liberal unless you give him more than you would give the man who did not need it what is a liberal provision for a wife that has no means of making her own living if the man is able nothing less than a sufficient sum to take care of her suppose mr vanderbilt who is worth two or three hundred millions i do not know what he is worth and i do not care but i suppose he is worth a hundred millions should agree to make a liberal provision for his wife and make it so that he gets away from the statute of frauds and thereupon leaves her twenty five hundred dollars nobody would say that was liberal why because that word is capable of a clear and reasonably exact definition to be liberal he would have to leave her enough to live in the same style that she has been living in with him and enough to keep her during her life anything less than that would be illiberal mean contemptible so i might go through all the actions of men in regard to contracts payments divisions we all know what liberal means and it always means a little more than the law could compel you to do if a man hires another and says i will give you five dollars a day and the other works twenty days and he gives him one hundred dollars nobody says he is liberal and nobody says he is mean but when the man goes further and says you have worked well i am very much pleased with what you have done there is fifty dollars or twenty five dollars as a present everybody says why that is liberal that is generous but no man ever yet got the reputation of being generous by doing exactly what he was bound to do he may have the reputation of being just honest of keeping his contracts of being a good fair square man but he never got the reputation of being generous and he never got the reputation of being liberal by simply doing what the law compelled him to do or what his contract compelled him to do or what he did in consideration of that for which he had received value in this case russell said 
i will make a liberal provision for you in my will if he had made no will the law would have given her one-third of his personal property that would not have been liberal that would simply have been the law that is the law and that is what the law has said is just whether the law is right or not i do not know but that is what the law says that is just and no man can be liberal unless he goes just a little beyond justness just a little so when he says i will provide for you liberally in my will in order to comply with that agreement he has got to go somewhat beyond the law and the law says one-third it is impossible for him to be liberal without going a little beyond one-third and then he is only liberal to the extent that he does go beyond what the law fixes now it seems to me that there is no escape from that nor does it seem to me that there is the slightest difficulty in your honor fixing what is liberal no more difficulty than you would have in saying what is right and we have hundreds of cases where a man has said if you will do so and so i will do what is right and it has been enforced has been enforced thousands and thousands of times i will do what is right i will do what is just i will do what is liberal i will do what is necessary and proper all these words have been judicially determined and their meaning fixed by hundreds and thousands of decisions i do not see the slightest trouble in that so in this case looking at the parole contract as bad and it is bad the woman is at the very least entitled to her dower and the only way that she can be robbed of it is by holding that a contract is good which was made by her without any knowledge of the value of the property that he held but every decision says that makes the contract void and that she is not bound to make examination herself he is bound to give her that information the law says that when two hearts come together in that way and there is supposed to be affection they must be candid he must conceal nothing his hands must be open not only must what he says be the truth but he must tell it all and she cannot be bound by any contract that she does not make in the full blaze of all the facts she must have them all and if he keeps back any if he makes himself poorer than he is he destroys the contract if he tries to take advantage of her the law says he only takes advantage of himself the court is her attorney the court appears for her for the preservation of her dower right and the court will not allow a man to take advantage of any misstatement of any suppression of any fraud no matter whether active fraud or a fraud that rests in non-action the court is her attorney and says the contract is bad and if you try to deceive her you deceive yourself and if you fail to put her in possession of all the facts the consideration of the contract fails and it is dead and done if these decisions have any meaning that is the law and if there is a decision on the other side i should like to hear it I haven't found one, not one, and in all the cases where applications have been made to set aside an antinuptial contract, I have not found one where the disproportion was as great as it appears in this case. The difference is between $6,500 and an estate of a quarter of a million. I have not found one that had anywhere near that disproportion, and yet case after case is set aside on the disproportion of about four hundred dollars or five hundred dollars a year and the fortune of eighteen thousand dollars one where it is thirty thousand and she gets about five hundred dollars i do not know of a solitary case where the deception was as great as in this i do not say that he intentionally deceived because i do not know and as mr pancoast remarked he is dead we simply go on the facts that are shown now as to the value of the property i do not think there is any real dispute about that 
mr russell is one of the executors and when he went over the real estate here on the stand he had in his hand a list of all that real estate with the values put upon it by our two witnesses and he was asked the value and he looked at the parcel and he looked at the amount and i tried it here myself just to see if i could guess what his answer would be i deducted in my own mind fifty per cent sometimes sometimes thirty per cent sometimes forty per cent and i hid it within five dollars in fifteen cases just guessing by myself what he would say because i knew that he was going by the figures without the slightest reference in many cases to what the property was worth he estimated one parcel at two thousand two hundred dollars i think it was worth about five thousand dollars he fixed another at three thousand two hundred and fifty dollars i think it was worth about five thousand dollars he fixed a third at four hundred dollars i think it was worth about six hundred dollars when he was asked about those same parcels without the figures he sometimes went beyond the price that our experts had fixed sometimes he doubled his own price and sometimes he fell below his price i think in one or two instances he even fell below but that at the time he had in his mind any knowledge apart from the figures that had been made by the experts i do not believe the vice-chancellor asks is it of any significance if your argument is right the disproportion is so great that it makes no difference mr ingersoll replies perhaps not then his co-executor was not called at all so i take it that we can safely say that the property was worth in all two hundred thousand dollars taking it according to their own estimate the estimate of the man who fixed it on account of the inheritance tax i do not think is of any weight he did not go over it all and did not see it i say the disproportion is so great they having failed to show that the knowledge was in her possession put there by him that the contract must be set aside that we insist upon one of two things has to be done it seems to me both those contracts set aside and her dower in the real estate given to her are both contracts allowed to stand and the court to fix what is a liberal provision in the will and in that for one i see no difficulty liberal is a word as easily understood at least as the word reasonable certainly as the word necessary certainly as the word convenient certainly as the word suitable and in fact i might say as almost any other word except some scientific term that limits its own definition now we have already said that a liberal provision could not be less than the law gives us in that view of the case she should have in lieu of her dower the five thousand dollars and on account of the will she should have at least whatever one-third of the personal property is worth it seems to me that one of these two courses must be pursued here is an old man who wants to get a woman some twenty-five years younger than he is just think how mr pancoast's blood would throb at a woman twenty-five years younger than he think what visions would haunt his brain think of the cupids that with outstretched wings would follow in the darkness of the night as he contemplated his happiness here was a man of that age who wanted this woman and taking into consideration his ideas of money a man that considered a thousand dollars a liberal provision one worth two hundred and thirty thousand dollars or two hundred and forty thousand dollars offering her five thousand dollars he wanted her badly you can hardly think of a more wonderful thought visiting his brain than that of giving all that money for a woman nearly twenty-five years younger than himself i want to be kind to mr russell i want to say that he was honestly in love with this woman i want to be respectful to her by saying that the affection was reciprocated and that on her part it was absolutely honest but i do say that mr russell withheld from her the information as to his property mr russell endeavored to drive the best bargain he could and i say that by keeping back the facts he was bound to make known to her he defeated himself 
that while he did deceive her he destroyed his contract now by no way of reasoning i can think of can you arrive at any different conclusion all matters of this kind of course should be dealt with from a high standard the highest standard we have the very highest the affection that man has for woman is in my judgment the holiest and the most beautiful thing in nature the affection that woman has for man that affection that something that we call love has done all there is of value in this world it has civilized mankind made all the poems painted all the pictures and composed all the music take it from the world and we shall be simply wild beasts far worse than wild beasts for they have affection for each other and for their young so i say this should be treated from the highest possible standpoint and treating it in that way your honor must say that a woman must act with a full knowledge of every fact that had any bearing upon the question to be decided by her and if she was not put in possession of all these facts by the man who said he loved her then the contract is void on the other hand if the contract is held valid and with it the agreement to provide liberally for her in his will then i say that there can be no liberality that does not go beyond the law in the one case she is entitled to five thousand dollars and one-third of the personal tea and in the other case she is entitled to her dower this ends chapter six argument before the vice-chancellor in the russell case this ends the works of robert g ingersoll volume ten legal the dresden edition published nineteen hundred recorded by librivox volunteers in the latter part of two thousand seventeen